All right. Well, my name is Sarah Hader. Um, I'm just going to start with a few introductory notes, just um, because I assume that there are some people who are not familiar with Exposables in North America. Um, we, uh, I co-founded the organization in 2013, and our mission is to advocate for the acceptance of religious dissent, uh, to promote secular values, and to reduce discrimination for those who lead Islam. And the last part of it is actually quite a difficult task. When we first began, we were really focused on building communities for ex-Muslims, and this involves this kind of a lengthy process. Um, both Ghada and Stephanie were part of our communities, are part of our communities. Um, and it takes, so there's a security process for people who want to come and who want to join, and then they can be a part of that local support network. Um, and this is, of course, because the threat of violence is unfortunately very real. Um, but we, since we have been more outspoken and since the communities have been kind of growing, um, we know that the landscape for ex-Muslims is changing and even the security needs and necessities are changing. So we're having a lot more public events um, and engaging as much as we can with the Muslim community. And our main goal is to just change this climate for ex-Muslims, um, which means changing the conversation within the Muslim community, but also uh, the conversation about Islam at large. Um, and we found to our frustration that this conversation is often very limited and very polarized. Um, it's very easy to get a religious person to talk about, uh, you know, extol the virtues of their faith and how it's made them wonderful people and how they believe in it so much. And then it's also very easy to get, you know, nativist type people who are there to say, well, Muslims don't belong in the United States and the West and Islam's values will never uh, will never work together. And, and it, so this is very, very difficult because this is actually not what reality looks like for most people, for most Muslims and for the outside world that's engaging with Islam. So we want to be a part of this conversation. As ex-Muslims, we don't believe in the religion. We're often quite hostile to, to the beliefs and the tenets of the religion, but we have Muslim family members and friends and we were Muslims, so it's hard for us to demonize Muslims, um, uh, you know, Per se, you know, uh, it's very hard for us to do that because it's you know it's your mom, it's your dad. You don't want uh, you don't want any bigot to come after your mother because of what you've said. And the, the goal for us is to do what we can to spark uh, a Muslim enlightenment uh, to some degree, to open up um, Muslim communities so that we can have conversations about even ways in which religion doesn't really fit into reality. So, what's the point of this talk? This is one of my favorite topics, and it's actually quite contentious. It's very, um, I mean, if you pay attention to Islam-related issues on the news, the hijab features very prominently, and it, there's a surprise that it does. It's a very visible symbol of Islam, and it's very spooky to people who are outsiders and don't know much about it. And unfortunately for hijabi women, this means that they represent a lot of different things for a lot of different people. Um, so we're here to talk about it from our perspective. Of course, we are non-believers, we're atheists, um, and are, we, are, we are very concerned about the modesty culture in general in religion, and we're going to talk about the ways in which the hijab plays to that. Um, Stephanie and Khalil will talk about their personal experiences. They both have very interesting experiences. I don't. I don't have a fascinating story or anything, so I like to gloss over it as much as possible. But they have great stories. Um, and different stories as well. They really highlight different experiences with the hijab as well. So what we are thinking we will do is each of us will speak a little bit. Um, they will speak hopefully a little bit more than me um, and talk about their experiences. I'll wrap up and then we can do um, a Q&A, which we always really look forward to. All right, so you can, you can start any time you want, Ada. All right, um, so hi, my name is Ada, I'm from Saudi Arabia. Um, when I first started to um, think about what I wanted to talk about today, I was wondering, like, how am I going to introduce myself? Am I going to introduce myself like today? Like, hi, I'm Lada, I'm an engineer, I work here in the United States. But that doesn't really tell you like my story and where I come from. Let's just say that like, five years ago, I lived in Saudi Arabia, uh, and one night I decided to get on a plane and come here. And I, and I did that in search of freedom, and I never looked back. Uh, so how did I get to here? Um, I'm going to start all off with my early years. Um, ever since I could talk, my mom started indoctrinating me with Islam. Um, you know how kids, you know, when they get tucked into bed, they get bedtime stories. My bedtime stories were all, uh, you know, prophet stories, stories of the Muhammad and his descendants. 
Uh, and every night also, right before I went to bed, after she tucked me in and left and gave me the kiss and said, let's, let's go to bed, I would ha she would ask me the questions that the angels are supposed to ask when you go uh, in, 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 in the grave, which is like, who is your God? What is your religion? Who is your prophet, etc.? Which is a thing that um, Muslims also teach um, their children, like once you, once you die and you go into the grave, then they, there will be two angels, Munkar and Akir, and they will ask you these questions to um, uh, see where you, which, what your religion you are, and whether or sh should you, you should have uh, a window open to heaven or a window open to hell. Uh, so that was the questions that I had. At the age of seven, uh, like a lot of other Muslim kids, uh, my mother and my father taught me how to pray. Um, as any child, when they're seven or eight, and they learn to do something that is repetitive five times a day, I got bored of it and I stopped doing it. Unfortunately, that, was, that didn't do very well. Um, with my parents, my mom found out there was hell to pay. And ever since then, my family uh, made sure that for at least a whole year that somebody was there with me when I prayed and I would have to pray in um, a loud voice so she, they could hear and they would make sure that I'm doing it correctly. When I was nine years old, um, I wore the hijab, not because of my own choice. At nine years old, as you're a child, you don't really make good choices at that time. My mother told me that because now I'm nine years old, I'm supposed to, I'm considered a, uh, a, a woman, and uh, from now on, I have to uh, put the scarf on me, and I'm considered a woman. So, and one of the things that I I don't know how to put this in. Um, I was the only girl in my school that wore hijab at, in third grade. Um, in schools in Saudi Arabia, they don't really impose hijab until you get to about fourth or fifth grade, and then from middle school on, you have to cover your face every time you, you enter and leave uh, the schools. But I was the only one at nine years old, second and third grade, that wore hijab. And that ostracized me and made me feel pretty horrible. So fast forward, I mean, that wasn't very interesting. My middle school went through high school. And then, um, so how did I leave Islam if that was like how I grew up and all indoctrination Islam all over me? When I, when I got to high school, I started to think more about like, maybe I should learn more about my religion and answer these questions that I don't like about religion. So this started out with reading the Quran. And if everybody knows, there's, there's a, um, a chapter in the Quran uh, called Anisa, which translates to women. And it is, dedicated to mainly women's issues and what to do with women, but it's not exactly the most uh, just uh, chapter or it doesn't really give you, as an example. It starts off with uh, allowing men to marry up to four wives, and then it goes on to allow sexual slavery um, by, uh, in the form of what they call medikit aymanikum, or um, what your right hand possesses. And what uh, this means is, is girls that were uh, captured in war and now are sold off as sex slaves. It also uh, gives authority over women, um, even allows men to discipline who they deem as rebellious or um, uh, wives that don't listen. Uh, it, not only to discipline them by talk, speaking to them, by um, admonishing them, uh, it also allows to beat them if that doesn't happen. Whereas the issue um, for rebellious men or men that uh, have problems with their wives is not to go ahead with a woman and like admonish her husband and beat him. She might compromise. Uh, to reconcile her uh, relationship with her husband by compromising one of her rights. Like, let's say, um, you don't have to pay for, uh, you know, my housing allowance or alimony or anything like that. Which I found to be not exactly fair when it comes to how you uh, treat husbands and, and wives. This is not equality, in my point. And that made me question quite a lot. And I remember asking my mother this question, um, how is it that when um, a wife doesn't listen to her husband becomes you know undisciplined or something. Then the husband is allowed to discipline her up to beating her. While well, uh, if the if the husband does the same thing, then the, the wife compromises her rights. It doesn't make sense to me. The why is it the same thing with both of uh, in both cases? And her answer to me was because when a mother uh, strays, and the whole society crumbles. Which still doesn't make any sense to me because I mean. A lot of people make mistakes, and society is still you know, up and running, and nothing's happening. Um, another thing that also um, 
added to why I left Islam was uh, falling in love and realizing that it was ridiculous that you know I could be with this man that I absolutely love and a relationship with him, but that is a sinful relationship. Whereas if you know on the day of my wedding I meet this complete stranger and sleep with him, that is completely a okay. That didn't sit well with me. And finally, it was just that there was no really no actual spiritual connection that I felt. When I was Muslim, it was more that I was af more afraid of my mom or my dad finding out that I wasn't praying or didn't work hijab than this God idea. Uh, so that's how I ended up leaving it. Uh, so when I was about 20, 19, I left Islam, took off the hijab, and I didn't look back ever since. So to the topic at hand is hijab. Um, a lot of people, especially when I've had that, not just in the West, in the Middle East as well, uh, where I grew up, Everybody tells you, like, no, hijab doesn't hinder women's progress. It's actually, like, it empowers them. But it's not, that was never the case for me, and I never saw uh, it that way. Because when you wear hijab, hijab is not just a cloth. It, the modesty and uh, doctrine that comes with it is applied once you wear it. So one of the things that I couldn't do as a nine-year-old, as a child, like, I couldn't do cartwheels. I couldn't go play with my friends. I couldn't just run around because then, you know, your hijab might fall off. Your, your, um, your pants might like go up a little and your legs could show. So all of those things, like it really was very toxic to me and it made me feel like a lot of my childhood was taken away from me. It made me a little angry, but years later, it's got better. Another thing that I really hate about uh, hijab is that it's, it imposes this modesty culture that is extremely toxic. Whereas if you are a woman and um, you know, you're walking down the street and somebody harasses you, now that's your fault because you're not wearing Modest, modest clothing, you're not wearing hijab, and so hijab is supposed to protect you from all of this. And the more you talk about, especially fundamental Muslims, they love to say that, that, this, that hijab protects women from uh, you know, outside, uh, outside people staring at them and harassing them and trying to rape them, which, again, is putting this, uh, all of the, the victim on the, uh, all the blame on the victim herself instead of on the people that are doing this crime, that perpetrated this crime. And that, to me, is like, they're just, they're making rape culture thrive. And that is completely unacceptable to me. Um, another thing is that, you know, men aren't allowed to wear hijab, but women are. They're made to wear hijab, which, again, is an inequality in my opinion. And, and, and it didn't sit well with me, especially during the hot summer months. I have to be covered up, uh, you know, long sleeves, the, and the clothes have to be, you know, not sheer. Uh, the hijab has to, like, cover certain areas. Whereas like my brothers and my father, they're walking around in shorts and t-shirts and enjoying life and going to the, you know, the pools, and whereas the women don't have that, uh, the capacity to do that. And a lot of what I've heard from Muslims, at least here in the West, this, you don't hear that a lot in the Middle East, is that um, hijab is, is the choice. You, know, you don't have to wear it. You can still be Muslim and not wear it, which is true. You can still be Muslim and do all sorts of sins. But, in order to be, like hijab is considered a wajib, which is mandatory. It's, compul it's a compulsory thing for Muslim women in order for you to be like the most pious, wear hijab, and because when you don't wear hijab, that's a sin. Um, I've seen, um, I hate talking about this, but I, I wanted to talk about it, just touch upon it a little bit. It's, especially these days in the past, I've noticed this a lot in the past three, three years, not even five years since I've come to the United States, but there was a lot of trying to normalize hijab in, in Western culture. And I'm not trying to say that it's a bad thing, it's not. But trying to make it look like, yes, this is what the Muslim woman should look like, it also demonizes Muslim women that decide not to wear it. Now, they are looked down on because they're not you know, representing their societies or their communities. And um, another thing, and I think Sarah also like, touched upon this in one of her talks, um, or when she was, I, think, I remember when she was in Bel Belmar, this is an actual, uh, the hijab is a fundamentalist doctrine. It is not like, you know, an, an, a normal, a Muslim that is a little more liberal doesn't wear hijab, doesn't, because it's, it, it, it hinders their, their, whatever they want to do, it, it stops people from, it, it, I don't know how to explain this in, in a way. It just seems to me like a fundamental regression. It's not, an, it's not something progressive. 
And, the, and, and I've seen, especially in the past year, they're trying so hard to make it look like hijab is some kind of like, progress, like this is, this is the liberal way of, ex of expressing yourself. And hey, if hijab is that, if that's what it is for you, that's great, but that's not how it is for a lot of women. Women in my, in my country that little girls in middle school will have to cover their faces. So that's not exactly something that, in my opinion, should be celebrated. And that's all I have. <laughs> <clears throat> um, thank you. Uh, hi, Stephanie here. Um, to give you a bit of background, uh, I'm an ex-convert, so I converted to Islam, or reverted to Islam, as they like to say, at 18 years old. Um, about a year and a half after conversion, I met the man who would become my husband, um, got married, uh, had children, studied Islam during those years quite a lot. Uh, my studying Islam led me to eventually um, not being able to accept several of the, the rules and tenets of it, and I eventually left it. Um, my husband saw it coming before I did, and sort of preemptively um, found a way to, to take us to a place um, to the Middle East where he could kick me out and keep my children so that uh, they wouldn't be raised by an apostate mother in the West, thus guaranteeing them uh, the hellfire. Um, so to give them a chance to heaven, and much of this has to do with modesty. Um, to give them a chance to heaven, he is now keeping them there uh, in a country that severely restricts their, their rights, rights to live, rights to choose, and rights to be, right to be whatever they might want to be. Um, I remained a Muslim in total for about almost 12 years, I believe. Uh, wore hijab for eight or nine of those years. Um, five or six of those in the West, in Canada, uh, and then three of those, almost three of those, um, in North Africa. Um, so, you know, in my case, um, when I first converted to, to Islam, it wasn't sort of the theology that appealed to me. It was really, really, uh, for various reasons, um, it was the so social structure um, and the gender roles and the modesty culture that attracted me to Islam. Um, I was, I'm a victim of long-term sexual abuse by a close friend of the family that started in really young childhood until mid-teenage. And I do think that this is what um, pushed me a lot to, to that sort of restricted um, gender roles and social, social structure of Islam and, and the hijab and the modesty culture. So I thought, you know, if I had been raised by Muslim parents and raised as a Muslim, I would not have been sexually abused. Um, the sexual abuse led to severe body image issues, which again, I thought, hijab, I'm going to hide. I'm, I'm going to hide and I don't have to look at other women's beauty and look at my own lack of. Um, I don't have to think of my feeling bad about myself, all that. So um, the, you know, the, the hijab felt uh, like protection to me and like it might, you know, if, again, if my family had never been Muslims, Mus uh, had always been Muslim, that would not have happened to me. Um, obviously, as time went by, um, I did realize that that was a very naive way of thinking. Uh, polls after polls, surveys after surveys will show you that women in the Middle East are severely sexually harassed, usually more than 50% in every single Middle Eastern country, so that will not stop sexual harassment. Um, it also did not make my body image issues go away, rather it deepened them. Um, just because it's evasion, it's almost like a drug. In, in my case, hijab was almost like a drug. I would use it to run away from issues that I had rather than dealing with them face on. Um, several years into hijab, I realized my issues were still there, but then I was also stuck in my own little personal portable prison, uh, completely suffocating under it. Um, so again, the, the, the need to hide, the need for protection, um, the thought that it does protect you from unwanted looks, unwanted attention from men, uh, harassment, um, that it's, it's you know, better for God. So you, you put a moral value on the clothes that you choose rather than just it being, you, you have to dress to get out of the house, either for weather or for you know, expression. It becomes all about pleasing God and hiding and hiding yourself from men. Um, so, uh, you know, I, and I must stress that I did choose it. It was an, I did not have, I, I wore it before I met my husband. Uh, I was not pressured into it by family um, who are not Muslim. 
Uh, I wasn't pressured into it by community. I definitely chose it 100%. So I know that that exists. That's, um, that's you know, definitely a fact. Um, I chose to take it off when I did realize that it didn't, it didn't actually help me handle any of my issues. I, that was just avoidance and denial. Um, and as I was realizing that my issues were still here, and, and modesty culture had not, um, you know, helped me to manage them, then it, it really just became suffocating. It really does feel like a portable little prison. Uh, you become policed. Uh, hijab, to Rada's point, it's, there's a whole code behind it. There's, it's not just, oh, I'm modest, I cover the shape of my body, the color of my skin, the, my hair type, color, whatever. You, you are expected to look down, not speak very loudly, not laugh very loud, loudly, not stomp when you walk. Um, you're, you know, Muslim women can't even recite Quran in front of men. That's modesty culture also. That's part of the things that she should hide uh, from men who are not related to her. So, um, you know, all of this, um, the, the portable prison part, the suffocation, um, and my realizing that all my issues were still there, eventually I didn't see the point anymore. It became hijab and, you know, as I was also questioning Islam and starting to doubt it, pleasing God was not very central either. Um, as I was getting better psychologically, the gender roles did not appeal to me anymore. Uh, so, you know, I, I did um, end up taking it off and then leaving Islam. Um, as I took it off, I realized that there was definitely um, consequences to this. Even as a Western woman who chose to wear it without Muslim family except for a husband, there is community, again, community policing. So uh, my Muslim female friends uh, would, would, it's like at every outing or every party that there was, um, it became the central point of discussion. It, it was done lovingly. It wasn't done with bad intentions. They cared, they cared about me and they cared about my hereafter and me you know, making it to heaven. And to your point, Rada, it is a requirement. It's an Islamic requirement. It is not a choice. You can sin and still be a Muslim, but it is a sin. You must cover up. You must be modest. And there are things that you're not supposed to show. And they are detailed in the Quran um, to an extent. So what you're not supposed to show men. Um, it became, so with women, it became, they would keep reminding me, giving me books on hijab. Um, of course, the men in the community, I wasn't friends with them. There's heavy, in, 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 I was a very practicing Muslim, so it was pretty segregated everywhere I went, at parties and stuff. Uh, but men would look at me even less and refuse to speak to me um, when I took it off. So there was definitely consequences. Um, when I look at hijab now, uh, years later, and I looked at what I look at what attracted me to wear it, um, and I look at the reasons why I took it off, I realize that there there is harm in modesty culture, especially ingrained modesty culture. That even when you choose it, the harm will still remain. It, it will harm you in various ways. Um, you know, my daughters were put, like Hala, in hijab at, at age eight. At eight years old, they were put in hijab. Um, they love Islam. They love Allah. They want to please him. They want to please their dad. They have been told since almost infancy, since birth, that it's not a choice. You have to do it, and you have to do it so that God will love you, that your parents will love you, and that your entire community will love you. Nobody will love you, including God, or respect you if you don't. Um, they were put into it at eight years old. At 16, they will swear to you that it's their choice. What choice did they ever actually have? They have been told from birth that it was the only acceptable choice, the only respectable choice, um, and that there would be consequences if they do not make that choice. So, I mean, they love it, but what else do they know? So there's a whole notion of choice here that's actually for the majority of women, it, it's not a choice like it was for me. There is some level of pressure, if only scriptural and religious, uh, if not you know, social and, and family. Um, there is usually a form of pressure to wear it. Um, pleasing God is a big pressure. It's, it's a very heavy pressure for someone. Um, it's, um, 
again, it changes your behavior. So my daughters uh, at eight, at seven and three quarter years old uh, considered their cousins as brothers. They could laugh out loud, they could tumble around with them, they could cartwheel, they could play sports. Uh, they could laugh loudly, they could scream, they could, they could speak out. And then all of a sudden, from one day to another, you can't do that. Your cousins are now men that you can marry. They become strangers. You have to be to look down, to lower your voice, not to laugh out loud. You can do sports alone at home in a closed room with your sisters because no men should see anything bouncing. The hijab might um, undo itself. The dress might move. So there's, their childhood was effectively ended at eight years old because we expected them to behave like modest adults, like modest women. Um, there is something terribly, terribly, terribly wrong uh, about this sort of shame, bodily shame that is encouraged by modesty culture and that can begin very, very young um, for, for, for so many girls. Um, in my case, I wore it as an adult, but I also, I struggled when I took it off. Um, I didn't want to wear it anymore. I didn't see the point, but I perpetually felt naked. Um, I would wear, you know, long sleeves and pants and I still felt naked. Um, I still had, you know, um, I developed a shame, not just about, I already had body image issues, but then I developed a shame about my sexuality as well and my, be, you know, feeling empowered as a, as a woman in my body, as a woman in my body. So there are several harms that come from it. Um, the glorification and the normalizing of hijab. Again, it's one thing to say women have the choice to do what they want. We will accept that choice versus it's a great and beautiful and empowering thing for women. It's not. Many, many Muslim women today and men will tell you that um, hijab was brought by God so that men would pay attention to their intellect and not to their body. This has zero scriptural basis in Islam. Uh, everywhere in the Hadith and in the Quran where it's mentioned that women should cover, it is to not make men sexually excited. Uh, there is no, and when, and when the Prophet did mention women's intellect, it wasn't so that it would be respected. It was usually to say that they had not, not so much of it um, compared to men. men. Women lack in religion and in intellect. So um, there is, that, that has zero scriptural basis. So I'm happy for you if you feel empowered as a woman in your hijab. But to glorify it, and uh, we had um, The Gap had a marketing campaign, publicity campaign, where there were children below 12 in hijab in it. This is glorification. It's not empowerment. Again, there are many dangers associated to that. Um, for, for these young girls who feel like, what, even the non-Muslim people tell me it's good for me. Can I really take it off? Uh, probably not. Um, so, you know, there are definite harms to it, and I think these have to be, um, these will have to be addressed and will have to become part of the conversation, and you can't talk about the reasons to wear hijab, Islamically speaking, and be, uh, receive hostility for it, saying that you are, you know, a racist, Islamophobe. Um, you have to be able to, to, to have a discussion about the hijab and, you know, modesty culture and what it means. Um, if a woman decides to, you know, with a brain um, devoid of indoctrination, chooses that this is the way she presents herself to the world, that's one thing. But in most cases, it is not devoid of indoctr indoctrination. It, they have been heavily indoctrinated. Um, so that's, um, and also another thing, modesty originally was mostly meant as behavior, not so much as clothes. So religions have a bit hijacked modesty. Uh, to mean clothes, and again, ascribing a value to clothes. Um, closing uh, comment, many women have told me, and I have read comments of women um, everywhere on the internet, that you know, uh, non-Muslim women who, who don't cover up, who might be wearing a mean dress or something, and will say to Muslim women wearing hijab that I admire your choice of modesty and your self-respect the, the very unthought statement, like the statement that was not thought through, because if you say that I admire your self-respect because you choose to cover up, it does mean that not covering up is something that deserves a lack of respect or deserves disrespect. So again, ascribing a value, a moral value or a value to clothes other than just as a method of expression and dealing with temperature or hygiene or something like this. Um, again, a, a pretty 
dangerous um, concept for young girls who might want to take it off but can't because now it's not just their communities telling them it's better for them, it's non-Muslims telling them it's beautiful, empowering, and great. Well, can we give the, these two ladies a round of applause? <laughs> like non-Muslims would say that, when I took off my hijab when I was in, in, in college, uh, one of the girls came up to me and she had, and she was a Catholic, she was not, she was a non-Muslim. She was, uh, she said, but, but isn't it, don't you feel empowered when you wear it? I mean, this is your, your religion. I mean, all of these other girls in the Muslim Student Association, they wear it and they all talk to you and tell you and tell me that it's empowering to them and it makes them feel like, strong and, and uh, you know, it hides you know, what their beauty so they don't have to like wear, care about what they're wearing. Like, okay, that's not like part of what Islam is, but okay. Um, and at that point, I was still Muslim. I hadn't left yet. I just, I was questioning. I took it off because it, um, it, it, it felt suffocating, just like you said. And it has been suffocating to me ever since I was a kid. Unlike, unlike Stephanie, I didn't wear it because I wanted to. I wore it because I was indoctrinated and my parents made me wear it. And uh, it's when a non-Muslim does come to you, when you, took it, you take it off, it makes you feel guilty for taking it off. It just, it's like, I don't even know how to respond to that. Yeah, well, there's just like, there's not, there's not a lot of um, public understanding of what the hijab is. That, again, things just fall down two different, there's two different ways of engaging with Islam in general. So the feminist argument against, uh, against the hijab doesn't really, you know, it doesn't really intrude in these in these conversations, but it should because that's what that's what this is about. Ultimately, it's about women's rights and control over our bodies and the ability to to you know to to walk around and expose what we want to expose and even be to be sexual, um, to 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 be flagrant about it and and still be deserving of dignity and respect. Um, so I don't have uh, you know too much that's very interesting or fascinating about my story. Um, but I, you know, I was, I was raised in the United States. I was born in Pakistan and immigrated here as a relatively, relatively young um, child. And so my, the majority of my upbringing has been in the United States and my familiarity is with the American Muslim community and the American Muslim context. So it's always been that minority, majority, Distinction, and I think I mean Gada, you were you were brought up in Saudi, so you didn't you didn't really feel it from that. You don't have that specific experience. So it, it, the Islam in in the United States, it's given a protected status because it is a minority religion for a lot of understandable reasons. It is in Saudi too, but for the complete opposite. For different reasons. <laughs> reasons. For different reasons. Um, all right. So that that kind of that social dynamic, uh, I think. It's, it's interesting and it's worth exploring and it's worth thinking about in, in, in a depth that it hasn't been thought about so far. Um, but anyway, I, I was raised in what I call a relatively liberal family. And um, by that I mean relative to other Muslims. So I was not forced to wear the hijab, but I had to cover still. I, mean, I was not allowed to wear capris and <laughs> show my, my, my calves, I guess, very sexy. Um, <laughs> And I, I wasn't allowed to wear a tank top, so of course I never learned how to swim because I, I too was not allowed to, I had to cover a certain amount by the time I was seven or eight years old. Um, and, you know, so I call that a liberal upbringing because compared to some of my cousins, compared to some more religious Muslims that I knew, I had a lot more freedoms. I was allowed to read what I wanted to read. I had male friends, although we, of course, we're not spending too much time together. We're not going to sleepovers at their house. But um, I, I, I had a f kind of freedom that I think many Muslim girls do not have, but fortunately, some do have, especially in the in the United States and in Canada, which is which is great. Um, so it's liberal compared to other Muslims, compared to the American, you know. It, it, the American levels uh, relative to, to standard American childhood, probably very conservative. Um, so that was, that was how I was raised. I started questioning religion when I was 15 or 16 years old. I'm not sure quite when. Um, I was very ideologically grounded, though. I believed when I was a believer. I thought this, would, this is the right path. This is the way the world is. And I was a big proselytizer. Which is like, it's, I kind of am a proselytizer now. I mean, I'm an activist, so I still, I'm still trying to convince other people to join, 
you know, me wherever I stand. Uh, but when I was younger, I was, I was really convinced that this is the right way, that this is the reality of the universe. And I just wanted my non-Muslim friends to not be burning eternally anywhere. And I just thought it was the compassionate thing to do to get them to see the light and beauty of Islam. So I was, I, I think I was actually pretty good at it. Um, and then I, I grew up a little bit and got to understand a lot more about the nature of the universe. And so the reasons that I left um, were kind of standard atheist reasons, which is to say there were logical problems with an omniscient God. Uh, there were uh, you know, the ways in which it didn't really square with the scientific understanding of the natural world. So those were all very influential to me. And then I left, I left the faith. Um, and I was alone for a long time. I didn't know anybody else like me, and I kind of, I, it was a two-way street where my Muslim friends started to avoid me, and I started to avoid them because I didn't want them to, to, to look at me the way that they started to look at me, and find me suspicious the way that they suddenly started to find me suspicious. Um, and I lost a lot of friendships, a lot of friends, they found out I was, I would no longer believe, and suddenly we were not friends on Facebook anymore, and I didn't answer my calls and all these things. So there was a little bit of that social stigma that I went through, and um, it was, it, it was something I thought, okay, well, there's nobody else like me, so this is just the end of it, um, and I'm just going to try and blend into American, you know, mainstream society as much as I can, and pretend like this didn't happen to me and this wasn't my background. Um, but. You know, in, in around 2012, I met an ex-Muslim for the first time, like in the wild, and it was this um, incredible experience for me. I, didn't, I had no idea that there could be somebody who was a free thinker, who was a skeptic, who was a humanist, who came from my background, who was like me. Actually, I thought he was lying at first, so like pick me up or something. I was like, this, this, can't be, this can't be real. And then it turned out I was, and I, I remember the way that it felt, and it made me feel as if I wasn't... I wasn't totally insane. I wasn't, you know, a traitor to my community. That there was, a, there was something really real about this, and there was, um, you know, that there was a justification there. Um, so it helped me. It helped me understand, regain my sense of self um, from that perspective. So this is why I, I helped co-found Ex Muslims of North America. I wanted to create a, an organization where ex Muslims could find find each other and have a sense of community that I lacked for so long. Um, and now, now we, we, do, we do stuff like this. Um, I don't have much of a history with a hijab. Uh, I was never forced, and like I said, I was a relatively liberal family, so I don't have a history with a hijab, but I do with modesty in general. I did put on the hijab by choice in middle school for about a year, which was uh, to the amusement of everybody around me, because it wasn't, it wasn't really anything in my community that everybody did. Some of my cousins wore. Um, but all of a sudden, here's this 13-year-old who is very religious, all of a sudden, and I'm reading the Quran, and I'm feeling very intense about it, and I put on, I put on the hijab. Um, and it's interesting to me now as an adult atheist to put myself back into these shoes. Um, you know, no one forced me to cover. My mom wore on and off the hijab, but it never, it was just not forced. So it was by choice, right? And But we do make choices that are, in hindsight, very bad for us, sometimes morally dubious. I was too young to really understand the implications of covering and what it meant on a broader on a broader level. I didn't know that the hijab is a part of this larger tradition of female modesty and positions, of valuing women purely by their chastity and um, and their and their modesty. I just knew uh, in the way that a simple child knows that you know, the good women around me were the ones who were covering. The ones that the women that the community looked up to as this beacon of morality were hijabis. And I also knew that this is what God wanted for me. To the extent that I understood why um, was just the simplistic narrative of, I mean, I think this is the metaphor that we've all been very familiar with of, of, a, <laughs> of a can unwrapped candy, right? And this is, it, this is a meme that's shared around, you know, <laughs> Muslim like social networks and something I think a lot of us are familiar with, where a woman, there's a picture of a, of a candy that has a wrapper, um, and this is a hijabi, this is supposed to be hijabi, and then there's a candy without its wrapper, it's covered in ants, and that's a woman without a hijab, you know, it's supposed to tell you something really meaningful and deep about, uh, about the cover, and for, for, you know, one reason or another, again, I was a child, I thought, okay, so maybe there's something to that, and I don't want to be the one with the 
you know, I don't, I don't want to be the one with the, with the ants covering me and whatever this means, impurity that this means. I don't want that to happen to me. So I, I adopted this. Um, and I, I think I also felt, because I was starting to be influenced by Western feminism a little bit as well, because I grew up here, um, was this kind of twisted feminist justification, which, is, which had a lot more to do with privacy and autonomy. <coughs> Right? So it was, hijab makes what should be private, private. It's a way of getting distance from the male gaze. And so this was a way for me to own my body and my sexuality by, by doing this. And I remember um, this was on, I think, uh, Trevor Noah's show, the, the Daily Show, um, where a Muslim researcher and activist, she came on the show, and she described her hijab this, in this really interesting way. It's a, it's a way that's really, it's pleasing to the ears of of Westerner, right? So she called it privatizing my sexuality. I was like, that's really interesting. Like, that's an interesting way to put it. Um, and it's not entirely baseless because you do, you know, to some degree feel as if, okay, well, I don't have to worry about being, being sexy anymore because I'm whatever this is. Um, but of course, the argument is really dangerous if you think about it for more than a second. Um, it assumes if if, if wearing the hijab and covering up is privatizing your sexuality, then it assumes and conflates uh, your sexuality with your body entirely. Your body is your sexuality if covering your body is privatizing your sexuality. Um, and that conflation just sort of extends from there, and you will see more conservative, uh, you know, either t teachers, and then, and then you hear about this from like places like Turkey and Pakistan, where imams will say, well, women shouldn't laugh too loudly. It's, you know, it's, it's inappropriate. And women shouldn't smile too, too, you know, in public because it's inappropriate. So it's just the sort of thing that just extends so that all of female movement and expression is just a, an extension of our sexualities. And at that point, you're left with a society like Saudis, uh, like in, in, in Afghanistan, where women are just completely erased from the public sphere altogether. Um, and it's interesting, I found this out as an adult. Um, the word, what is it? How do you say it in Arabic? I'm not an Arabic speaker. Aura. Aura. Aura, 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 Aura yeah. right? It Aura. means private parts, right? Like private. Essentially. Yeah. The, what, the thing to be covered, right? That's, Aura means, uh, it comes from the word ar, which means shame. Mm -hmm. yeah. Shameful parts. Shame, shameful parts. Parts of shame. Um, yeah, okay. What, how much have? Oh yeah, I'm gonna keep going. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, it, it comes from the word shame, right? It, these are these are your private parts. That's that's the Arabic word. In Urdu, the word for woman, the common word for woman, aurat, I had no idea, but it comes. It stems from yeah, it stems from that word. Um, so it's 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 one of those things like to go back to privatizing your sexuality, but if it, it just extends on from there so that all of woman and all of female expression and beauty is sexuality and therefore something that needs to be controlled. Um, or in Arabic, there's another word for, um, at least in, 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 in the Khadij, the Gulf region, they call women hurma, which comes from haram. <laughs> really? Yes. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah, that's incredible. But I, I've, I've seen, and I can't go into this for too long because I have five minutes apparently. I'm going to go for maybe maybe ten. I'll do that. Um, uh, you know, I, I've seen that feminism to some extent has been corrupted, or at least Western feminism has been corrupted by uh, a very a very misguided cultural relativism. Um, and there's the basic idea is that well, this is something valuable. And you touched upon this a little bit, Adana, and you know that it's something valuable in their culture. It's assumed, so it must be valuable inherently, right? And this just assumes that our cultures are static. They don't move, they don't, have, they don't make mistakes. They don't have, you know, they won't improve. But of course in the West, if weren't one were to say that, that this is just a Western tradition, therefore it's valuable, that would be a crazy, it would be a crazy thing to say. Um, and I've seen just generally that Western feminism has, you know, by Western women, it has been withdrawing from its universalist claims. These, these very same claims that were very motivating to me when I was first leaving the faith and feeling empowered as a woman and, and starting to feel strong about it, these arguments were very important to me to understand that all women have a dignity and all women deserve to, equality under the law. Um, and then now to see feminism retreating to some degree, um, cowed maybe, um, I don't know exactly what to say or how to say it, but I know that in, in, within Eastern feminist circles, for example, the, the many, many women who are fighting against the hijab, against enforced hijab in Iran, it feels as if it's a little bit of a betrayal. 
Um, and it feels as if, well, they got theirs. You know, they live freely. They have freedoms. And now they're saying, well, actually, feminism was never a universal thing anyway. And culture has meaning and has value in here. Um, you know, which of course begs the question, who speaks for a culture? And here, what we find in the West, especially, the people that are on the stage, the people that get to speak, um, are the people that are valued by the community. And the community can say, we stand behind this person. And inevitably, that's the person that's not going to embarrass the community. That's the person that's going to go up there and say, the community is perfect, <laughs> and we are besieged by outsiders. Um, so, so, so we have to think about community dynamics to some degree, when we're, especially when we're looking for spokespeople. Um, and I have a general problem with doing that in any case, when it comes to minority groups, we tend to find like a spokesperson for African Americans, a spokesperson for you know Muslims, uh, but this is problematic in a lot of ways. In any case, um, I want to touch a little bit uh, about since I ha have to skip skip some of this um, about choice in general, and we've touched this several times um, with with the two of you about what choice means. Um, and you know, and when when is a choice a free choice? I think that that conversation is really very complicated, um, and it's not something. I mean, I'm not a deep enough philosopher to talk about free will or what choice means. Um, but I think it's interesting that in the West, you know, we have women who have legal legal equality, and we, there's Muslim women, as you guys you know mentioned in your your talks, who are active. They're vocal. They stand up and they say very loudly and proudly that they're Muslim and they're wearing the hijab and this is their choice. And it's hard to look at some of these women who are, you know, they're loud. They actually are, they're there, they seem powerful, they seem like they're in control of their surroundings, and it seems condescending to say to them, well, actually, you're very oppressed and your culture is very bad, you know, and you don't even know how oppressed you are. So it seems like it's a kind of a condescending argument to make, to tell to these women. Um, and I, some examples of these might be the Women's March uh, co-founder, Linda Sarsour, uh, Representative um, Ilan Omar is a good one, although she doesn't talk too much about the hijab issue. But more and more you see in the media these, these cropping up of these women who, are, who genuinely are, I think, strong, and they genuinely are outspoken. Um, and we tend to see them as, this is what the hijab is, right? And it's, this, is, this, is, this is what a hijabi woman, woman looks like. Um, and I, I can understand why that confuses people. Like, of course, this, this is the opposite of kind of what we're saying here. Um, so of course, this is more than a little confusing. So maybe we can clarify it a little bit by thinking about the social reality of Muslim women. So it, while it may be the case that an individual Muslim woman is powerful, is autonomous, you know, because of the way, either the way that she was raised, or maybe just because she feels that way, and who are we to take that away from her? Um, you know, maybe, maybe that's the actual case, and we should we should give that to those women. And I think it's a, it's in, it's kind of be strange to then tell somebody who's saying I'm strong and I feel powerful. Actually, you're not. Um, however, we're you know that we are talking about groups. We're talking about a tradition. We're talking about whole countries, and individual exceptions to the rule don't make the rule uh, less important. Uh, don't make the rule any less real. Um, but when it comes to choice, I don't really like to think about it as whether or not it was a choice. I like to think about choices made from which options. Um, and, and, and one way of thinking about it would be, let's say, if we were to, we were to look at a, a Western woman you know, in America from the 1950s who says, look, I want to be a housewife. This is what I want to be. This is my choice. This is not, nobody pushed me into this, nobody forced me into this. This is who, this is genuinely what I want. That's, that's interesting, right? That maybe she did make that free choice. And then that you could have a woman in 2019 say the exact same thing, stand up and say, look, I want to be a housewife. This is what I want to do. This is how I want to live my life. This woman made a choice, made a choice too. But it's important to see that these two women from the 1950s and 2019 are living in very different social contexts. The options available to them are very different. So the, the, the woman in the 1950s was saying, I want to be a housewife. Well, let's decide, let's, let's, let's think about what would happen if she decided not to be a housewife, right? How much, what are her employment prospects? What is her social reality going to look like? How many people are going to refuse to have contact with her as a you know, 50, 60 year old woman, childless, who just refuses to, 
to even touch the idea of, of uh, matrimony. So this matters. The social reality matters. The choices in which the, the, the options in which you're acting within matter. And this is what we need to think about, and this is how we need to think about the hijab in general, that there is a social reality here, that there's a context here. And that context is one in which if you choose not to, if you choose not to, there is just a whirlwind of you know, abuse and stigma uh, and you know, sometimes in some countries uh, you know, legal action that's awaiting you. And this matters, and this matters when we think about what, what choices. And you know, I'll just end with this. Like today, I work with countless women who are forced, truly, truly forced. By that I mean bound, beaten, brutalized for the sake of such a modesty. Um, and you know, and it makes me think of the act of having a choice or being able to say, "I have a choice." It really is a privilege. You know, you're privileged to be able to say, to stand up and say, "I have a choice." Because the ones who don't have any choice at all, who are really struggling against it, they're not on a stage anywhere. They're not speaking, they're not writing New York Times op-eds, they're forced into the situation that they're in, and they don't have a voice, right? I mean, like all, vic like all victims of injustice who are truly deprived, they are not only deprived of justice, but of the power that comes from speaking and being heard. Um, so yeah, I think I'll, I'll end it there. Go well, ahead. Add a few things. Uh, so to continue on what you were saying, the lollipop, the candy, wrapped versus unwrapped, there are several uh, memes and posters that are going on on the internet about this. Another one is the pearl in the shell. Another one is a used, a secondhand used old car that you don't cover in the winter, but your BMW or your Porsche, your, your good, respectable, expensive, um, you know, good car, that one you'll cover it in the winter. Uh, the, 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 the common thing here is that it, you're always an object. The woman is always passed off as a shell, a pearl in a shell, a lollipop that's covered, or a car that's covered. Um, the purpose of hijab, scripturally speaking, is extremely objectifying and sexualizing. It's reducing women and, to an extent, children, girls, to your body is sexual and nothing else. Um, an example of that, my daughters, um, they were swimming in the sea uh, at three and four years old, th three and four. My husband said, that's it, they're, they're done. They can't, they can't wear bathing suits anymore. Um, they have to wear shorts until their knees and t-shirts. And I asked him, okay, that's a bit young, like for the whole modesty thing. Are you scared that men will be excited when they see them? And he immediately freaked out, haram. And how, how, how can your brain think like this? It's not my brain. The reason for hijab is to not excite men. So modesty, not just hijab, modesty culture, right? So this is not my thought. It's your thought. Now you're seeing this on our three and four years old, which is extremely disturbing. Um, again, the purpose, the scriptural purpose of hijab is all about sexualization. So when women, and it is condescending to tell women who say that they, and then they are, you see that they are empowered. They are empowered, that is true, in their hijab. That's despite religion, not because of it. It's, right. it's in spite of religion. And I think it's just, it's important to, un just, just because we focus on hijab right now, we're focusing on modesty. It's not a superficial practice. It has a deep significance. And it's part of the many ways in which uh, Islam is a gendered religion, just like Christianity, uh, just like Judaism. Um, that this is how you get to heaven uh, differs dramatically depending on the sex that you are born with, and the sex should also determine the rights that you that you have on on earth to some degree, and in Islam certainly. Um, so it, it's it's one of those it's one of many many different ways in which women are uh, a secondary class in Islam, and it has to be. It has to be conceived in that context, in the context where women don't have equal rights of inheritance, uh, where they're uh, what denied equal rights of, of uh, custody, child custody, as as you know, um, Stephanie. Where there are some countries where there's no such thing as marital rape because, and they justify that using the Quran, saying that the woman is a property of the husband and she has no she has, she has no, right, no to, right to refusal. She has no right to refusal. She, she has, has no right, right to, to divorce, which I which I found. I find to be the most disgusting part of it. A woman can petition for divorce. A woman can ask her husband for divorce. She can beg her husband and pay him money to divorce her. Right. So she has to, but the point is, is she has to ask permission for divorce. And if he denies, she can go to uh, a religious leader, an imam, and she can ask him. 
uh, to, to... But she has to pay back but, compensation. But, well, right, and, and he can deny it too. So that's the other, the, the part of it is that they can both deny. It's just a request, it's just a petition. But a man doesn't need to, need, needs any, anyone's permission to, to divorce a woman. So there's so many ways in which the subordination of women is part and parcel of the faith and the way that it, it interacts with the, with the, with the practical, practical law. Um, and I think it has to be looked at in, in that context. So I think if you guys don't have anything else to add, we can just do question and answer session. If you guys are interested in that, that would be, yeah. So I think we have a microphone over there. Um, where, uh, I'm sorry, we would questions? love to have like a floating mic, but we just don't, okay. literally don't have one. So yeah, if you guys <laughs> ask questions, we can, we can form a panel over here. So if anyone would like to come up and ask your teacher something. Hello? Okay. <laughs> uh, oh, that's my nasally voice. All right. Uh, thank you for being here. I'm very happy that I can admire all of your hair. Um, <laughs> so uh, uh, I'm a, a, an atheist, former Methodist, um, and I'm still in the closet. Okay. Uh, with a lot of my uh, family members, I might not be after uh, after this. <laughs> so, so I. Uh, so compared to you, like my coming out would be a lot easier. Like I, I mean, uh, in at least a couple of your cases, you're taking your life into your own hands, uh, and possibly destroying m multiple uh, relationships. So I'm just wondering, like, was there like a spark, like this moment when you're just like, I'm going to take this risk. I'm just going to come out. Yeah. This is it. I can speak a little about that. My, my, um, it's a little extreme for me. It's not the same for these two ladies because they grew up in the West. I grew up in Saudi Arabia where women literally don't have a lot of choice in a lot of things. And uh, my life was controlled by my father. And, my, and as much as I love my father and I, and I respect a lot of the things that he's done for me because he is my father and he's done a lot, except he always liked to remind me that my body was owned by him, that I didn't own my body. But what really uh, sparked it, um, and in my case, because Saudi Arabia uh, does punish apostasy by death uh, or prison, depending on uh, your gender. It's another thing that for gender, they usually kill men, but they just imprison women. Um, <laughs> okay, so what I did was, um, the reason that the spark was when my father came to me and told me that um, because of how rebellious I was, he uh, was going to make me stay at home and he was going to make me uh, be a prisoner at home. That was the spark. That was the spark that made me buy the ticket, get out of the country, and that's how they found out I was an atheist as well. And it, it didn't ruin a lot of relationships, all of them. <laughs> uh, but um, you, you make... You make a new family, and one of the things I love about ex-Muslims in North America ever since I joined is that it introduced me to a family of my choice that love me for who I am, and I don't have to be somebody else without them. And, uh, and the other spark that made me want to leave uh, Saudi Arabia and become just me and, and come out was uh, people don't understand that living a double life really destroys you, kills you from the inside. You're lying every day to the people that you love the most. Every day I'm waking up and I'm lying to my mother, I'm lying to my father, I'm lying to all of my friends by telling them that I am Muslim and wearing the hijab when I, this is not what I want, I am lying to them. And it takes a toll on you, it makes you depressed, it, make, it gives you a lot of anxiety. Um, you can't, every time I would go out um, or um, you know, be with a friend of mine or try to be who I am, I'm always a parent, what if my parents call me, what if I see my mother here or see my cousin over here. And that actually happened to me of all places in New York City. I was wearing shorts. I was wearing shorts. I was with a boyfriend. And I saw a cousin of all. And it was the most horrific thing. And, and, I, and it was also one of the things that contributed to me leaving. It's like I did not want her to go back home and be like, hey, by the way, I saw Hada. She was short with shorts. a boy. She was wearing short shorts. And I saw her belly. Oh. <laughs> um, 
my answer to your question would be the double life, the lies, the weight of the double life and the lies and the suffocation of, it really felt like a little portable prison. It's not even a prison you can leave for a short amount of time unless you're at home. This thing is following you everywhere you go. So when the weight of, of the lies and living a double life and the, the feelings of suffocation become heavier than what you imagine or predict might be the consequences. In my case, I had not predicted the depth of the, the, the consequences I was going to pay for it. Um, I, I had not been able to foresee that, but I'm not sure if I could have done otherwise anyways in the sense that you, 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 you are like, you want to explode at some point. You can't, you can't lie to everybody anymore. There are things start to, you, you start to, 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 to lose your, your, your facade, your front. You, you, you let frustrations get out. And, and, and then that's how my husband saw it before I even saw it in myself that I was going to leave Islam and, and taking off hijab and all that. So that would also be my answer. I'm going to add a few notes to it. Sorry, these are going to be like, each of us are going to take our time answering the questions and then, and then we'll move on. But um, uh, a couple of points. One is that we did a survey of our members um, with the assistance of researchers from George Mason University, um, our community members. And uh, it was interesting because it seemed from, from the data that the women were more likely to be out um, than men, which is interesting, and that's not by out I mean out about their apostasy, which is which is which is interesting. I think, and it shouldn't be surprising. And from my personal experience, anecdotally, uh, a lot of the more loud um, ex-Muslims that I know are women, um, and I think that that's that's not surprising when you think about what you have to lose and what you when you're when you're making that decision about what do I have to lose by speaking out, what do I have to lose by not speaking out. Um, for women, certainly, by not opening up, it means subjecting yourself to a life that is, uh, you know, pretty intolerable to, to many of us. So, but for me, it was, it was this constant feeling of looking at all the all that was going on around me in my family and feeling as if, like, wow, this my mom is this has been raised in this way and she thinks of herself as uh, secondary to men. And she, she would reveal that in all these ways, like if there would be a car crash or something, and she would say, well, it, w it wouldn't have happened if that was a man driving. You know, and just little, little things that she would say that would reveal to me that she didn't think that women were competent. And sometimes she would say that. Like, women are not as smart as men. She would just, she would just say these things, but she believed it. And it was shocking to me because she's such an intelligent woman. Um, and so I, I started to just feel as if there's a, there is a lot of injustice in the world in general, but especially when it comes to, you know, to women's rights um, and to human rights in general in Muslim communities. So if I'm out, I can actually engage with Muslims. I can change their minds. And if I'm not out, I obviously can't do that as effectively. Um, so that was, that was the reason that really that, that I, I came out. Um, but just to go back to the point of uh, living a double life. This is kind of unrelated, um, but I, we, unrelated to this topic, but when it comes to um, extremism that you might see with uh, second generation immigrants, uh, Muslim immigrants, and I don't know how many of you are familiar, but there are several studies on this, uh, especially in countries in, in, in the UK and Europe in general, where they have uh, they have the Muslims that have been around for some time, and they're second generation immigrants and third generation immigrants. And they find that there's a lot of second generation uh, Muslim immigrants who are, uh, I mean, at that time, I'm, at that point, you sh I think you shouldn't even call them immigrants, they're just children of immigrants, um, who are actually, they're very um, interested in extremism, and they, they, they are very, uh, I mean, it's, it's something that you wouldn't expect because you would expect them to come into the fold and become more westernized, but that's not exactly what we're seeing. And I think some of that has to do with this double life, uh, but it's, it's not quite a double life. It's the, it's the idea that they can't really be a part of any world. You know, they can't, if you're a Pakistani American like me, well, if I go to Pakistan, I'm, they, they're going to call me an American. You know, I'm not, I don't fit in there <laughs> and I don't fit in with that culture. I fit into this culture. Um, but when I'm here, I'm the Pakistani and I, and because of the way that I was raised, where I couldn't go to sleepovers and parties and all these socializing were haram and not available to me, I couldn't fully be a part of American society either. So you have, you actually, it's not trapped between two worlds, it's trapped between no worlds. You don't have access to, to, to any, or to be a part of any of those identities. And, and then in that landscape comes Islam. And this is this universal faith, and it's giving you the sense of identity and purpose and belonging. And it doesn't matter where you're from, and it doesn't matter, 
you know, what, what culture you grew up in, you have this religion, it belongs to all of humanity. So there's a lot of, um, that's, I think, you know, I just wanted to add that point because I think it's one that people should be thinking more about. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, so first and foremost, thank you all for coming. Uh, all three of you are, in my view, incredibly brave for not only coming out as ex-Muslim, but also using your platform and like, working publicly to fight against, fight for a cause that you believe in, and despite you know what you may hear. So thank you for everything that you do. Um, I've been debating a little bit for the last hour whether to come up here and say this on camera because I'm also a closeted Pakistani ex-Muslim. And uh, my, Sarah, my story actually completely mirrors yours. I discovered you in like 2015. I was on YouTube watching, I think Sam Harris uh, debate like Reza Aslan or something, and I saw you in like, one of the one of like the watch later videos, and I saw your whole video about uh, ex Muslims in North America, and I was like, wow, like, a her story is exactly like mine. B, it's crazy that like, there's you know like there's a whole community of people who are just like, me. and that was really cool to me. So uh, thank you for everything that you do. And so now moving on to my question, uh, it pivots slightly from the discussion on uh, modesty culture and uh, the hijab. In my view, uh, modesty culture seems to be a horrific symptom of the kind of radicalization of the Middle, Middle East, uh, specifically Muslim-majority countries. And at the heart of the issue, it seems to be that's like socially rewarding almost to be more like fundamental, more radical. And it, there seems to be kind of uh, more of a clap back against being more, I guess, like liberal, right? And uh, so if our whole goal is really to kind of secularize the Middle East, because I feel like that would kind of fix a lot of these problems that we face as ex-Muslims and as, I guess, progressive Muslims as well. Um, like, how do we circumvent that barrier, that social reward that comes with, I guess, being more fundamental? Yeah, well, I mean, the incentives are only in one direction, right? I mean, you don't have, you don't actually have the option to be, to be liberal open. And thank you so much, by the way, for coming up and, and yeah. saying that. That's so lovely. I'm a little disbelief I'm talking to you, to be honest, because oh, I've been following okay. you for like four years, but yeah, <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, thank you. And, yeah, of course. It's an honor. Um, but, it, you know, the, the incentives are only, only go in one direction. Um, if you want to be, if you're a young man and you have, you, you want to be somebody and you want to do something and you want to make your family proud, um, you're going to do that by becoming more Muslim. You're going to do that by becoming more conservative. Because the other directions, while they may be somebody, somewhat open, maybe you're an entertainer or you're a singer, there's also stigma attached to all of those professions and anything that is a little bit more, uh, you know, a little bit more liberal, there's stigma attached to that. So I think one thing we have to do is something quite radical. It's somewhat what we're doing here is just to make the concept of being an ex-Muslim and leaving the faith altogether a lot more normalized. And of course, I don't expect that people are going to love us, uh, that the Muslim community is going to say, these guys are great and they are champions for progress. They're never going to view us that way. But if they view us as something less than you know, uh, absolute demons uh, trying, to, trying to turn their daughters and sons into, you know, into hellbound, uh, you know, uh, in the individuals here. If if we can just be, if we can just be normal human beings, um, and if we can have the right to life, which we don't have in in many Muslim majority countries, if we can have that much normalization, that's enough. That's enough to give a lot of people who are not as extreme as us some space to breathe and to to speak and write without as much stigma, right? So the first thing I think we need to do is to normalize apostasy. That's a, that's the first thing that we need to do. And then uh, before you know it, we, you will see more people stepping out, more people saying that I'm a little bit liberal and that's okay um, to some degree because we've taken a little bit of run of that heat. Um, but the label apostate has been, it's been so effective at shutting down dissent. Um, because if you are an apostate, you are, not only are you hell bound, you're going to go to, you're going to, go to jail in this life. Right, uh, or you're going to be killed in some Muslim majority countries by the law or by mobs. Um, so, if that label doesn't carry that weight anymore, then other liberals won't be afraid of deviating from the norm a little bit, right? Um, so, I think I think that's step one at least. Yeah, I think it just takes time. Honestly, it's it's all about time. Uh, I mean, it, my mother started out with sending me threats to now just sending me prayers, a little bit of threats, but more mostly prayers. <laughs> so essentially, the more out, and, and I have not gone like less quiet since I've come here. I've been like the complete opposite. I've been talking more. <laughs> uh, so it's just really time. The more time you give it, and, and then the newer generation, especially in the Middle East, not all not all of them. 
But there are some that are outspoken that are trying to change things over there that are, uh, you know, the more we speak, the more we give access, the more education people get, the less likely they're going to be religious. And the less religious people are, the more generations that come after it, and then just slowly. And, and just coming out, yeah, as ex-Muslim is so important in, in, in that, in, in that yeah. normalization. Because all you have to do is just say, this is who I am, and the loved ones around you who know who people think, you know, they'll think two things. Oh, they'll be afraid for you. Um, they'll be afraid for your, you know, eternal soul. They'll be angry at you, probably. Um, but a part of them will also think, okay, well, maybe this group of people, ex-Muslims, maybe they're not all so bad. Um, maybe, you know, maybe we would, we should be relaxed in our approach towards religious dissent in general and what we're willing to do to people who are uh, dissenting. And before you know it, I think you do see change. But it's, it has to be grassroots. The gay rights movement did this very well by their coming out, you know, campaigns just to be out and be proud. And there were studies that show, showed that if you knew somebody who was gay, who was openly gay, you were way more tolerant of homosexuality. That it had a, it had a real effect in that direction. So we can have that effect too, just by being open and just by being out. But thank you so much for coming. Um, um, speaking. Uh, um, speaking. Uh, we'll add something in there. You're talking about sort of community reward and, and as you are, you show more piety, more extremism, more uh, fundamentalism in your practice of religion. Um, as a convert, I found this to be excessively true. The more I learned Arabic, I learned Quran, I recited it. The more I knew about Islam and that, that you know, raised Muslims could come and ask me questions and I had the answers, I was so praised and so popular. And so, and if you start to doubt and question and you want to remove hijab, that those same people will, will begin to judge you, will begin to... Um, and and it's th this is again the, the community policing right it's everywhere as well as that sort of reward and praise when you do show more piety I, I'm not sure what is the actual definitely coming out more I'm not sure what is the actual solution within communities but if you if you look at at uh, Christianity in, in Canada and the United States uh, it, it, it reached for most Christian communities or at least many reached a point where it becomes in Canada, at the very least, it becomes almost um, obscene to talk about religion in public. So, I think there's this like it's not it's none of your business what the what your neighbor does and what's his religion or her religion and what they do with it. You become almost shy to ask about it. Why aren't you doing? Why weren't you at church on Sunday? You become embarrassed to speak. So eventually, religion will Islam will have not sure how we can do this, but we'll have to become more private. A personal thing. My relationship with God or a deity is mine. It does not belong to my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and every single person on my street or in my community. It has to become more personal and more private and less of a community thing. How we can get there is yeah. all those ways, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, once again, I think I, uh, all you guys, uh, thank you for coming out here. Uh, Sarah, I saw you on uh, Bill Maher, and I've been following the ex-Muslims on uh, Facebook, so I was really happy when I saw you guys were coming to ASU, because I really wanted to come meet you guys and hear, hear you guys speak. So I, I just wanted to say thank you again. And then my first question is, um, when you were doubting Islam, and you were thinking about leaving before you came out as an atheist, was there ever a time where you thought about reverting back to the religion? And have you studied any other religions and thought about converting uh, to them? And to kind of explain that more, uh, I'm an atheist, and um, I'm 24. It took me about, when I was 21 or 22, I decided I was an atheist. And it took a lot of hard thinking for me to finally make that decision because I was raised Christian by my mom and then I fully converted to Buddhism. But I've also studied and uh, wanted to thought about converting to other religions. So I've studied many religions and put a lot of thought into this. And it's, it took me a long time to come out as, you know, decide I was a full, I didn't believe in God anymore. So. Yeah. Um... I've never had any thoughts of reverting for any reason. Uh, it was just something, so if some people say you choose to leave Islam, right, or you choose not to believe. That's a, I think that's a crazy way to put it. 
Because I don't think you choose to believe or to not believe. You either do or you don't, right? I mean, if, it's, if I asked you to believe in the truth fairy right now and you didn't actually believe in the truth fairy and just do it by choice, you couldn't. You can't force yourself to believe something that just doesn't make a lot of sense to you. Maybe some people can, of course. There's, we call them, you know, like, maybe not exactly right in the head who can, who can choose to do that. Um, but for, for most of us, I think it's, there's no choice. You just don't believe it. You don't see any truth or any value in it. Um, my, I mean, I glossed over this but a little bit, but my process wasn't easy. It was short, but it was not easy in the sense that it was a lot of things that came together at once. I was reading a lot of philosophy. I was understanding other ways of thinking and being and, you know, what morality is or should be. I was encountering atheists for the first time, which I didn't think of. I, I, it shocked me to think to, when I encountered the idea of atheism, like you just, some people just don't believe, they just don't have this belief. And at first it really upset me. And I wanted to, because I was a proselytizer, I wanted to convert them. <laughs> and I wanted to get them to see the light of God. Um, and that was actually part of why I left, was I was researching ways to convince my atheist friends back into back into religion, and then I started to see that they were right about some of their <laughs> some of their some of their points there. So I, I think I'm pretty stuck where where I am as far as researching other religions because of the the quality of my of, of how I left. I became an atheist before I became an ex-Muslim, right? I realized there was no God, and it's like okay, well that that means Islam is not the way. Um, so that leaving Islam was peripheral to the to the to the leaving God. Um, prospect of my faith. So I haven't been interested in a lot of uh, other religions, but ways of life, traditions, Buddhism is interesting in other ways, not necessarily in its spiritual claims, but in, in there's a lot of other claims that it makes about how we should be thinking about the world that are interesting. So I'm uh, willing to explore those, and I do explore those. In, in my case, uh, because I live in Saudi Arabia, you know, everybody around you is Muslim, everybody around you believes in God. Uh, so when I started questioning religion, the first thing that came to my mind was like, okay, so there is a God, obviously, that, that is 100% true because everybody else around me believes in it, but what is the right religion? And um, because, you know, my, my narrow way of thinking, because I come from an Abrahamic religion, I thought only Abrahamic religions are true, therefore let me look at the original Abrahamic religion, Judaism. That has to be the true the true religion. And I actually was like, really interested in it, and I studied it, and I learned more about it, but then the more I saw that it treats women as just as badly, I'm like, yeah, this is not my religion either. Uh, it didn't bother a lot with Christianity, um, mainly because if I already X'd out Islam, might as well X out the other Abrahamic religion, and I already X'd out Judaism, and that's how I, I, mean, I, I did. But I never really reverted, reverted. I did, um, living, living a double life because of how hard it is and how it made me so unhappy and I would see all of the all of my family members and my friends and they were all Muslim and they were all happy and it made me feel like why can't I just you know try it you know, just try this whole believing thing maybe I can be Muslim too and it made me even more um, depressed than because not, not only not only am I lying to other people now I'm lying to myself about this this thing that I don't believe in. Um. To your point, Sarah, I think it's not a choice in most cases. You realize eventually you, it comes to your realization that I don't believe. And when you don't believe, it's you can't just convince yourself to believe again. Um, obviously, I've converted from Catholic, like Catholicism to uh, Islam. So I, I did, I mean, I know, you know, Christianity to an extent, Islam a lot more. I wasn't very interested in religion as a Catholic, but then as a Muslim, I was. I realized that the God of Abraham was not fond of women before I stopped believing in an afterlife and a deity. So, I mean, any other uh, Abrahamic faith is a no-no. I'm, I'm not going to leave one sexist uh, ideology to go straight in the arms of another sex equally sexist ideology. It makes no sense. Um, I, so I realized the God of Abraham is not my friend, does not like me a lot, and I'm more than you know not likely to burn in hell if I believe in him, so screw that. Then eventually I realized I, I don't believe in anything, um, like in terms of an afterlife and, and, and God, a deity, be it uh, creationist or not, um, interventionist or not. Uh, after that, when I realized I don't believe in, in any uh, you know, divinity, Philosophies. I looked a little bit into Buddhism and thing, and then I realized that breaches of human rights are there everywhere. Um, Buddhism considers homosexuality a deviance. Um, it does not consider it. If, if I understood what I was studying and reading well, is that Buddhism, like the the, the idea that you cannot legislate on it, 
but it's still considered a deviance. So you can't make it illegal by the state, but it is frowned upon as, as being unnatural. I realize too much breach, like religions, I mean, Abrahamic or not, they're sexist, they're also homophobic. Um, they're also, you know, many other things so i just they're also just illogical illogical yeah, i just so that was a, that was the case for me honestly i mean it's i think i think it, it's not the case for everybody and it kind of feels strange saying it but <laughs> but for me the morality part came second because i was i could have justified anything if i believed that it was true so what mattered to me is that it's true or it's not true because if it is the case that the god exists like uh, the, the abrahamic god exists and he has created the world and well, it looks to me that what he's doing is sexist, uh, or, you know, but who am I to say anything? Because he's the god of the world. <laughs> so the fact that he exists and he created the universe and he has this revelation, that is all very important to me. And with, that was the key, without it, without that piece moving, um, the, the human rights aspects of it would not have moved me you know, very much because I, I, the answer was always just, I don't understand. Stand, yeah. I don't understand, and the, the God of the, the, that created the world understands. Sounds better. Um, and I would have been, I mean, if I had still believed, I would have been a more one of the more intense um, you know, proselytize. I, I was as a kid, and I would have continued to be, and continue to be more extreme in my views, and apply it as religiously as I could to my life um, because I, 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 I'm a philosophical person and ideologically motivated person um, so I would have applied it and I would have done that so that so to me the right and wrong question comes after or, or sorry that's a weird word to phrase it but the, the true or not true question comes first and then the more secular more right in terms of secular morality or wrong in terms of secular morality that that uh, question came later see I reached like the opposite conclusion in that um, I during my process of doubting and questioning and then starting to, to wonder about God, um, I asked myself, okay, so what, I, I, I lean now to, like I, I'm leaning towards believing all of this is BS and none of it is true. What if I'm wrong? And then I had to really ask myself, what if I had evidence that Islam was the truth? If I possessed evidence right now that Islam was the truth, then I would have to tell myself that it is possible that gods and deities can be evil and not worthy of my worship. I would rather take hell from this Abrahamic monster than <laughs> <That's exactly laughs> on his conditions. So I, I reached that point before I reached the point of there is none, so I just will not worship this. Thank you so much. I, I had another question, but it's not that complicated. It should go by real quick. Um, I, I know you're from Pakistan, you're from Saudi Arabia, where? Or in Canada. Quebec, and then where did you travel around a bit? And then I wanted to hear, like, how, all three of you, uh, how many languages do you speak and how many countries have you been to? So, well, that's way too many countries, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> but, um, Stephanie, she, she was in Libya. So I was in Libya. Libya. In North Africa for a few years. That's where my, my husband, my my ex husband is a citizen. Actually, current husband is a citizen. We're separated, but uh, current citizen of, of Libya. Um, so I've lived there and uh, in Canada. And I mean, basic Arabic. I can manage ish basic Arabic. I can read it. I don't always understand what the words mean. Um, yeah. English and French too. Yeah, English and French, Spanish, Italian, a little bit. I can read and understand and hear and mm -hmm. understand. Yeah, well, I, I don't think I, I speak English. <laughs> I speak a lot of other languages badly. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Okay, so it seems that women in Muslim communities are under a lot of pressure to dress modestly. And so I'm wondering from your perspective, both within and outside of the family, do you feel that more of that pressure is coming from other women or from men? In my case, it was women. In my case, it was the women in my family. Um, uh, as an adult uh, working in a company, an international company back in Saudi Arabia, my mother would inspect my clothing and the way I wore hijab every day to make sure that everything is, is covered and that nothing was showing. And if she didn't like anything I wore, she would make me change it. The, doesn't, the, and what I wore were pants and shirts that are long that cover, um, you know, like go up to like mid thigh. And still she thought that that was too 
sexy. sexy. I mean, I don't know who would look at that and think it's sexy, but it unfortunately it does happen. On the men's side, I wouldn't say that it's a pressure. It's not exactly pressure, at least not in my case. It was more like men looked down on you and were condescending to you and treated you very, very differently than, um, let's say, a woman that was covered in a hijab. They would look at you as, uh, you know, public. Uh, just you know how like, when when you were saying that you know uh, the hijab you know uh, makes my sexuality private. Well, well, other men, some men in in those communities, when they look at a woman that's not wearing hijab, that means that her sexuality is public, open for business. Yeah, anytime, and any moment. So that's how I see. Well, for real, like some men actually oh, yeah, believe yeah, that in the Muslim world. Uh, and so, and in a lot of cases, a lot of girls wear the hijab to, to get out of that harassment or to get out of the uh, their their families, the, the females in their in their um, in their communities, pressuring them. Of course, fathers and brothers do that as well. Uh, but extension, the men, the, the most in general, the men in the community, they just look down on you and treat you horribly if you if you don't wear hijab. I mean, I think in theory. Uh, it's both men and women. Like men, most of scholars are men, and a lot of pressure comes from there too to wear hijabs. So I think in theory, it comes from both genders. Practically, inside families, uh, women are primary caregivers and educators. So, practically in the home, the, the pressure will often, I, or my experience, often come from women more than men because you, you're not going to deal with the men you don't know they can't even talk to you you can't talk to them you're not even supposed to look at them you can't shake hands so they're not going to start chastising you on your clothes they're going to tell you know your dad or your brother or someone your husband to tell you, your wife to tell your daughter to dress better so the pressure comes from both but practically the admonishment or the the the, the daily you know is often done by women because they're the sort of guardians of traditions and and rules and and things like that i mean, I mean you have to think about it from uh, from the perspective of the mothers who are policing uh, their daughter's sexualities and i try to to to, 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 to understand why this happens, because from every everyone I talk to about this, every ex-Muslim woman I, when I ask who was worse about this, that's, that's that question, it's almost always that the policing was was done by women. Um, and that's just an unfortunate fortunate reality, I think, that we can we actually can probably generalize because of because of how frequent it is um, that it that it occurs. Um, and I think from the perspective of, of a woman who grows up in an honor-based society, she's responsible for the way that her children turn out in a way that her husband is not. And she's going to be punished for it in a way that her husband is not. And I've seen this in, you know, in, my, in my own family, my extended family, where if, if, if children stepped out of bounds a, a little bit, um, you know, decided to maybe marry outside of the faith or you know, move out or so, you know, something, uh, that the, the, the husband blames the wife and punishes the wife, and there's so much control over her, too. Um, so to, f from the perspective of what is the duty of a mother, it's to, to raise these children to be God-loving and uh, to raise her daughters to be modest and to be chaste, and that's a reflection on her, and she will pay one way or another. Um, so I think that this is something that is also tied up a lot with honor culture in general. And I think that's why so many families, you know, even you can even make it broader than women. I mean, this is why families police it's their own members. They might not want to, they might want to be tolerant, but they just don't want to face whatever the, the extended family is going to get at them. And the extended family doesn't want to face what the community has in store for them. So there's a there's a way in which this dishonor spreads like a virus. But the first person that um, it, that it harms, in, in in my experience, has been the the woman and the, and the mother in the family. Yeah, the mother will be viewed responsible Islamically, though. Ultimately, the father is responsible for the piety of his whole family. Mm -hmm. So the, fa the, the man will be ultimately held responsible in, in front of God. So he has to tell the mother, right, yeah. his wife, make sure our kids <laughs> do, do. So there is yeah. like a sort of a, a, hierarchy. a hierarchy of of enforcing these rules. So. The man is usually on top, doesn't have to deal with sort of the daily, the day -to -day. The daily the application of this. Yeah, the micromanagement. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> the micromanagement, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. I'm uh, very happy to have this chance to see you and hear you. 
I am um, an atheist, a humanist, and a very much a feminist. And I have, one of the reasons I really wanted to come and see you is a couple of things that I, that I just have been having a hard time getting resolution about and figuring out kind of what to do and what can be done. For one thing, um, we have some uh, Muslims here, Muslim women here, who wear hijab in the legislature and other other uh, positions like that, and they're very, they're amazing women. So, and then, and so I'm, I'm like, so if I, of course I wouldn't go up to them and say, why are you wearing a hijab? But to, for, but to be concerned about women, especially like in full burqas and everything, if I say anything against that, about the modesty culture or anything, I'm often called a hater. <laughs> so there's that issue. And then, I'll, then also I start thinking about, well, things about the law, how are, how are women's and children's rights uh, protected? Like, it's weird, like, if, to get a driver's license, some women cannot get their picture taken with a naked face. And so my guess is they just don't get a license, which is really a shame. And, you know, that how much can, like, can it be legislated to uh, protect women's rights and children's rights? Like, it could be considered, you know, it's not healthy for girls to be shamed when they're children. And also that you know the men, the boys are are you know taught to uh, to not respect women or girls and women. So like I don't know, it's a conundrum. Mm -hmm. If you could like talk about that. I have a little thing to talk to say about that. It's, a, it's unfortunately not unique to Islam. This this little thing. I don't know how you could legislate it in order to protect children. Um, to this day, it's not con con indoctrination is not considered to be abuse, even though it is when you tell little children. I was two years old, and my mother was essentially telling me things that I was going to say when I die. I was two years old, and being learning about hellfire when you're uh, when, when you're seven years old, and you you you're told that if you don't pray, then a, little, a snake will come over and crush you when you die. That's that is abuse. Um, but the thing is, like in other religions, even here in the United States, that's something that I was talking just to Stephanie about, um, like Hasidic Jews, for example, uh, or the Amish, uh, they, they control their children in a way that makes it impossible for them to thrive and flourish outside of their communities. Uh, so if we can legislate something there, that could potentially help all the other families uh, that live in fundamental households, uh, hopefully not abuse their children, and protect their protect their rights and, and give them a voice too instead of the voice like have their parents dictate everything for them. And to your point, it's very hard um, from a sort of democratic and libertarian or libertarian <clears throat> standpoint to go in and tell police how people educate their children as long as there's no sort of obvious physical abuse and emotional yeah. abuse is not always recognized as being abuse. So I think so you can like you can make it illegal to marry off young girls. Yes, girls. That, that's one step. So right. I think that's it. The separation of church and state becomes so incredibly important right now for this reason. If children are going to be indoctrinated with no limit at home, then the public discourse should be undoing that as much as possible. Creationism in school, yeah. there's no scientific basis for creationism, but there is for evolution. You teach that, you do not teach. Um, the separation of church and state should be very, very severe, uh, very v applied, like always systematically, rigidly, to make sure that children receive a counter indoctrination message every day when they go out of the house. Um, I, I personally, um, religious schools, I, I'm not sure how this can be legislated, but that's an issue because then the children are getting that indoctrination at home, at school, and they don't go out anywhere else. So there's no counter discourse here. So I think separation of church and state and public discourse is what has to, at this point, at this moment, uphold the children's rights, mm -hmm. um, sadly.
You know, that's a, um, I'll just, I'll plug my other, my other group. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> love it. Well, um, a, a couple of months ago, I, um, I, I started, uh, co founded uh, another nonprofit because I love pain. <laughs> um, so I've, uh, which looks at just these issues about where, uh, about when society should step in. Um, and the, the, the co-founders of, of this organization are an ex-Amish woman and an ex-Hasidic Orthodox uh, <laughs> Jewish woman. Um, and the, the ex-Hasidic Orthodox um, uh, Jewish woman, uh, she started, she's a lot like me, she started her own organization as well, called Footsteps, that works to um, assist people who are leaving the Hasidic lifestyle. And we found, uh, the three of us, that we had a lot of the same questions about when when, when and where sh should society step in. And there was an anger there, that we all felt, um, that society wasn't doing enough. We weren't sure, though, and we're still not sure, I'm still not sure, about uh, where the law should step in and when the law should step in. But I think before we even have a conversation of what the law should do, um, do you feel that we, going back to what Stephanie said, that we're that we're having the appropriate, you know, conversation? Are we doing everything that we can socially to to address these issues? And I would say not at all, not at all. Um, do do does the average you know mainstream you know uh, American know that that there are people who suffer like this? Are we having these dialogue, these debates, and these kinds of panels? Mm -hmm. not. Sometimes when you do try to discuss it, you're probably a hater. Well, that's a, that's a big problem when it comes to minority faith of all. So the three of us, we all had this experience as an ex-Amish woman, as an ex, uh, you know, as an Orthodox woman, that we felt as if there was this bystander effect that was happening. Because, you know, if you did step in, if you did see it, that there, here's something happening, here's news happening, we have to say something about it, you're, you're smeared as someone who, this is not your place, this is not your lane. Um, these are these communities need to have these conversations amongst themselves. It's also, you're not liberal enough to yeah. accept. Right. Well, well, tolerance is, tolerance is an interesting. It's an interesting concept, um, and it's not something we should apply universally to everything. We obviously don't, right? And it's all about where those limits should be and how you know how how and when we, we should we should tolerate. And I I'm a civil libertarian, so I have a, I have a strong sense of people should be free to exercise their their deep beliefs, even if they're those deepest beliefs are things that I found revolting. I will you know defend to death their right to do it. Um, at the same time, this means I have the right to step in and call it revolting. You know, and I have the right to host that dialogue and to to, to have this this sort of conversation like this and speak about it and try and convince people. And I think in that latter point, we're just not doing that enough. Um, partially because of w what you mentioned, that people are worried about being called a bigot. They're worried that their you know, lefty card is going to be taken away from them if they question the practices of minority faiths, whatever they may be. Uh, it's complicated more, more you drill down, I mean, so it's hard to know for yourself. You're right. It's a, it's a very, it, what this is, is that it's a, it's a way to distort our public discourse. Just th throttle it to some degree. We're not able to have it effectively. We are not having the conversations we should be having. We have no idea about what America could look like if this engagement could happen freely and openly. We haven't seen that in America yet. So we should be fighting together. Um, to add to this a little bit, so in Quebec, uh, like New York, Montreal has some really populous um, um, Hasidic and Orthodox Jewish communities. And they have illegal schools um, that do not follow the curriculum of the country or the province at all. Uh, we have two gentlemen um, in Quebec who uh, this became like realized they were atheists and left the Hasidic community in their 30s and realized they don't speak English barely, they don't speak French, uh, they've never learned anything useful other than the Torah and like Hasidic studies. So they're like, we're useless. We cannot manage at 35 in civil society. They are suing the government in Quebec, saying you abandon hordes of children in the hands of fundamentalist parents and you do not make sure that the separation of church and state and the curriculum are, are imposed and forced to, 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 to be given to those children. I hope they win. 
I hope they win millions from the government so that th this will be part of that discourse, to that conversation to be had. Do you know when that, when that's... Uh... Okay. I, I have yeah, to go okay. in and look. Yeah, I sort of, yeah. yeah so, but it's, but it's, a, it's a very it's a complicated question, and I think that's a good one to bring up. Thank and you. it should be asked. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hello. Hi. Um, Stephanie, it sounds like you're a big fan of the French system then of secularism, because I'm a huge fan of it. Okay. Um, so um, I'm actually ex Catholic myself. I was an atheist when I was 11. So I left, and uh, I told my parents when I was like 15, it was kind of bad, but then they kind of got over it. So the whole Catholic guilt burning in hell stuff, totally familiar with that. Like <laughs> I totally get that. Uh, but, you know, the guilt's still there sometimes. Also, Sarah, thanks for retweeting me on Twitter. Like last year, I got like 500 more followers because of you. So. <laughs> All right. Um, now to my question. People, because uh, I don't consider myself an atheist. I'm an anti-theist. I don't like the word atheist because it's like, why do I have to have a label for something that is the default? Like, I don't believe in the tooth fairy, I'm not a tooth fairy. I'm not maybe Santa Claus, I'm a functional human being that is like, I don't believe in that crap. So I'm an anti-theist, not an atheist. I don't know if you have a problem with that term at all, but um, something I think it was Christopher Hitchens that brought, brought that up, and he's a big uh, like, part of my growing up. Um, so people like, I respect to a certain degree people like Magic Nawaz because he is liberal, he's trying to bring things into a different school of thought there. However, I think he's fundamentally wrong and dishonest about the like religion. So my question for you is, do you work with people that you think are fundamentally wrong about a faith if it will bring about more liberal people? Or are you like, screw it, this is about atheism, this is about rejecting faith, rejecting re you know any kind of religion, we're not gonna, have any middle ground, religious people are fine. They'll be bigoted towards them as people. But do you work with people like some like, you know, magic or something like that? Because some of my liberal Catholic friends, I can't agree with them. I'm like, you're not being a true Catholic because of this book. This is what your club handbook says. You're not following the handbook. I'm not I'm I'm not, you know, trying to judge you, but according to this, you don't believe it, so you're not that. You know, I think he's trying to bring back the, I think it's like the, Mu, the Mutazilite school. Yeah. Which, they were massacred a thousand years ago. That, that was tried. They lost. They were in Baghdad. They got all killed. So, I mean, do you work with someone like him? And do you kind of just suck it up and just say, you know, I think he's wrong on religion, but he's on our side with separation of church and state? Or do you say, you know what? I can't agree with you on this. So, maybe do that. Sure. Um, do you guys have much to add there? Because I, I do. But, oh, but so here's the other thing is that we're almost, I don't know if we saw the room for after, after eight? A little bit, yeah. There's nothing after us, so. Okay, okay. So, all right. Um, well, I, yeah, I work, um, Expos in North America, like we, we work with Quilling Foundation, whatever. Oh, so you, you so, do work with us. So it, it depends on what you mean by work, right? Um, <laughs> I will work with uh, I will work with you know progressive Muslims if we are working towards let's say passing a, passing a certain bill that we both agree we both agree with so there are limitations in which I'm willing to work with almost everybody I don't think it's right to be purist about it because then it would mean that I only work with other ex-Muslims <laughs> um, and even then there are a lot of ex-Muslims who I don't agree with in, in a lot of different ways. So then it would just be a smaller and smaller sort of way you work with. So from the practical perspective of when you're running an organization, you're trying to grow a movement, uh, I think you should you work with whoever you can work with in certain in you know in, in certain contexts. What I won't do is lie about my opinion about religion. And I feel and I have felt continue to feel you know a lot um, uh, a lot of pressure by a lot of people to to deny the idea that there is a tension there between reformist Muslims and ex-Muslims, and that there is a kind of a, a, a lie that you have to buy with them. And to me, it's just, again, it's, I may be a little bit black and white in my thinking. Um, so it, it, it's not a tension that I can get over, the fact that there is one lie that you have to accept, which is the lie that this God exists and that this book is Revelation, right? And I'm not willing to, I'm not willing to cede that ground at all. Uh, because what it means is that now I, I have to, if I have to, if I see the ground that 
Quran is revelation, maybe, or maybe there's some truth to it, then when I talk about women's rights, I can't just get right to the point. I have to talk about how, well, the Quran actually allows for women to have equality in such and such context. You know, I'm held hostage to to to, to, to that ground, and I'm not going to I'm not going to go there, and I'm not going to agree to that. Um, so I think that for moving forward, it, when people come come to me and say, and when it comes to people who oppose my my thinking and my approach, um, is usually there's usually a pragmatic argument thrown that way. So that's just to say that there you can't. You, you know, 1.5 billion people or whatever it is, 1.8, however much it is now, they're not going to apostatize overnight. You're not going to get them to ex accept apostasy given that there's such a, such a stigma behind it. So pragmatically, if we want people to be more liberal, if we want people to be more accepting of equality, we, have, we, we can't use the, the ex-Muslim angle or the Islam is just wrong um, angle. We have to go towards the reform angle, which is to say that you know, maybe there's something salvageable about faith, and it's coming from within the religion to some degree. So I think that, I think one, the ideolo ideologically, obviously, that it's wrong because there's a lie that, that is being told. But the, the second part is the pragmatic argument is wrong too. I think, it, I, I, I really think it is. I know that it is, actually, because what I've seen is the growth of an ex-Muslim movement. I haven't seen the growth of a reformist Muslim movement. There is no movement of, you know, there's a thousand years ago. Right. So I mean, there's a there's a couple of there, there are a couple of people now who are active and they're speaking up. It's not a movement. It's not a growth of people. We are a movement. We are growing and we're growing fast and we're growing in in parts of the world where you would never see, you would never see atheism uh, sprout. You know, just just a hundred years ago, two hundred years ago, it was impossible to imagine that atheism would be present to the levels that it is. And now we're seeing that. Um, and I think the internet has really given us the strength to harness this. And we have truth on our side, we have reality on our side, we have logic on our side, we have a lot going for us. They don't really have all of that going for them. What they're asking for people to do is to commit to secular values, commit to a secular way of life, while still thinking that actually, but God wants me to live this way and I will burn in hellfire if I, you know. And I actually think that that's less pragmatic. I actually think that, that fewer people are going to take that, take that route. Um, and that the easier thing to do, especially when it comes to Islam, because Islam thinks of itself as such a perfect religion, um, that if you point the mistake, the rest of it just falls to pieces, it falls apart. Um, so I think pragmatically, this is the way to go. Uh, I think the ex-Muslim movement is the future. I'm seeing evidence of it everywhere. Um, so I think there's, you know, there's really only one choice there. Um, and when you look at the sort of idea of reform, it's kind of like saying, the scripture is not wrong, it's your human interpretation that's wrong. So you've got like a front line of very modern, let's say Muslims who are saying it's your, the fundamentalists, this is not real Islam, it's an interpretation. It's, it's giving a bit of protection and cover for, for the, the, the can't, it's written black and white, like women, um, you need two women for testimony where you need one man, you will get half the inheritance. You owe obedience to your husband. Um, there's no going around it. You can't pretend that this is not, it's an analogy for what? So th that sort of reform movement, to me, sometimes I get frustrated because I feel like it's kind of um, saying, yes, you are right. The problem is not in scripture, it's in man's head. No, the problem is in the scripture. It feels like intellectual dishonesty in my case, and it exactly. feels, it is. And, and I'm a lot like you. Like, I look at my Muslim friends when they're like, no, but this one doesn't really say that. Like, it, it does. does. <laughs> it's clear. It does. It says it right here, and I would show them where it is in the scripture, and then they're like, yeah, but you know, I mean, uh, you know, I'm like, I'm like I mean, you know, there's always the context, or, you know, God will be, uh, you know, he, he will give us, you know, we, we don't know, you know, God knows everything, and then they just put it aside. But, yeah, but I'm not a very happy, I mean, I don't like the, I mean, it's great that there's a reform movement, but. I don't think they themselves believe in the religion, so it doesn't. I because if you're, you're trying, trying if right. you're exactly. trying to change the religion, that means that maybe you just the religion don't, isn't you just true. Agree with it. You just agree <laughs> why would with you it. change it? So let's make it more progressive. So why not just put it aside and? Look I, I don't. Yeah, I just don't think it's an argument that most Muslims will buy. Yeah, because I mean, to them, they, like, oh, so you think our, our religion is wrong? Right. No, so, no, no, no. It's not wrong. Your interpretation is wrong. Let me show you a new interpretation that is better. But they go so beyond interpretation to degree. Sometimes they say that certain certain verses should be abandoned, which is that's 
Just that's not if you're admitting the thing is not the actual word of God, then just screw it. Right, and I think that that's going to be especially intolerant to, to, to Muslims in general. And I think it's, it's just like we said, it's, it's an intellectual dishonesty thing. And once you're held, once you're held to to the scripture, it's this dual task of maintaining that this is the truth and this is beautiful and this is valuable, while trying to mitigate the harms inherent in that same beautiful, valuable text. Right. So it's just how can you do this effectively? And I think you know, we find that they actually can't. Hello, ladies. Thank you for coming. It's my first time meeting ex-Muslims or even atheists in person. Oh, wow. Welcome. Yeah. <laughs> it's a big thing. Yeah. So a little bit of context. I am an ex-convert. I am married to a Muslim, a Shia Muslim in specific. And I... Um, how do I put it? I was in love with the guy, and then somehow religion made its way in, and um, the, it all started off with him saying that, you know, my parents would be happy if you did this, and stuff like that. And right now we're at total ca crossroads because I came out to him that I no longer believe, because it started off as me trying to find justifications for the uh, rules that initially I was told uh, were things that protect women, were totally logical, but I started seeing inconsistencies. And um, now we're at crossroads where he's like, you either believe or we have to split. And he has parents telling him, she's not wearing, uh, she's not wearing the scarf, it's okay if you can, you know, you can hit her or these kind of people are okay to divorce. That's the kind of advice grown-up adults are giving a son. So, and last year we went to India and uh, what happened was I put my view about the hijab in front of my father-in-law and after that conversation he just told me and my husband that if this was the case he asked us never to come back to his house again. So the uh, there's a lot that we're holding on to and it's really difficult uh, even uh, from the view of my husband who's still a Muslim even if he wants to you know uh, if it, even if he wants to research or if, or he wants to, you know, look at it from an open-minded perspective. There's so much, has, there's so much at stake, where he, there is a possibility of his parents disowning him. So that reflects on his attitude towards me. So how can I deal with it? It's very similar to you. So I'm just not yet there because I don't have kids as yet, and that's what we've been holding off to. But then there's love in the marriage, and we want to make it work. But we have his parents who's, uh, who are giving him this advice. And it's just really hard even on him. Yeah, I mean, this is, it's, it's a very difficult situation. I'm sorry to hear that you're, you're in that situation. Um, if there's love in them, I don't know. It's, it's not, there's no easy advice to give, and I'm, I'm not a social worker, a psych you know, psychologist, or therapist, or anything like this. Um, but I mean, it, it depends where your husband positions himself in that. Is he willing to, is he willing to handle his parents' disownment and wrath because there is enough love in that marriage? Or does he put his parents' happiness about him, you know, before? So, so it, it really is, it's going to depend on your husband what, and you, what you're willing to accept and not accept. If you had kids, would you... If you had daughters, would you be would you be willing to raise them as Muslims? So what it all comes down to is, he just tells me that see they have a point. They're just worried about our afterlife. So that's he, their worry to keep for for themselves, really. It's true. <laughs> so it's it's gonna be um, it's gonna be a hard one to navigate. Uh, and it's you. really about what you want, right? Mm -hmm. It's uh, are you willing to stay with him despite uh, these things that happened with his uh, with his family, 
uh, that he's a Muslim and that he potentially wants to have children with you and raise them also Muslim? Um, are you willing to stay and, and listen to all of this um, over and over again? And honestly, it's a choice that nobody here can make other than you. And it's a very difficult situation. And I, no, I mean, I, I, I can't even, Maybe the closest thing I've been to you was dating a Muslim. <laughs> like it was, I can't even imagine. And he was the most condescending to me. And because of that, of calling me like names because I was an atheist and because I wasn't a believer. Uh, he was also Shia. I don't know if that has... You no, know, it's not. Uh, so it's... I To me, and because I only knew him for a month, I wasn't married to him, I didn't fall in love with him, it was easy to just break it off. Uh, but... In your case, it's something that you have to sit with yourself and listen and prioritize. Is this important for me? Uh, is he worth this? Uh, am I going to regret this later? And then just make this choice on your own. And, well, I, I, and I really I mean, wish you all the best. Thank you. Yeah, it's not uh, an easy position at all. And just to echo what they said, of course, I'm not in your position. I'm not a social worker. But I know that a lot of women reach out to me. Um, and I, I mean, I've, now I've heard every story in the book because just people email me and send me messages and obviously the, the work that I do with, with SMA. But um, a, a lot of women reach out to me who have had kids, who have married a Muslim, have had kids, the kids are Muslim, and now they're cut off from the entire family. And it's such a common, it's, it's, it's to some degree a Steph's story. It's a very common story even in the West, even when the, when the family is here. A lot more than um, you think. It's a lot more, a lot more than you think. And all I can say is you don't want to be in that scenario. That that's a very, very painful position to be in. Until uh, you've resolved things with your husband yeah, so and with his family. Uh, that's the only advice I would really dare to, to give you. And you may or may not take it, but avoid having children. Don't. Yeah, well, I, I yeah, I, I dare to give advice. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just like, I'll, I'll tell Avoid the children. Here's what you do. But, but, but the thing is, like, when you're when you're with someone, even when they are abusive to you, and I'm not saying your husband is abusive at all, but even an abusive husband, it's very difficult to leave because it's to because it's it's something familiar that you have, and, and they're still they're still loved despite the abuse. Right. So it's it's. I think what Steph said is he willing to put you above the family is really, really important. And that's, that's even important when it comes to you know, marrying or dating ex-Muslims, because we also have families, many of us have families and are still connect, connected with our families, and our families tell us to do you know, X, Y, Z. My family, like, I'm a very open ex-Muslim, was like, well, when you're gonna get married, of course you're gonna do like a nikah, right? Just so we can tell people that you did the, that's an Islamic, marriage. No, you're gonna you're gonna do that, right? Everybody knows I don't believe <laughs> What are you what? Every, people in Pakistan know I don't believe like everybody is. But it's that pressure is on everybody and then and then even even on ex Muslims it, it's still there. And even with ex Muslims, if you were dating or marrying an ex Muslim I would say, are they willing to put you above their family? Because their family will have a lot of demands and especially once kids arrive, things change um, and you know people change. Uh, so that's just something to keep in mind. But I wish you luck, and thank you, thank you for coming. Thank you. Well, first I wanted to thank you uh, for being here, for doing what you do. A uh, bit of context: I'm um, from a Christian Middle Eastern family that grew up in France. So, bonjour. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so, like growing up. Especially like coming from Lebanon and like living in France, um, grew up like a lot of thinking about like how like the interaction between like Muslims and non-Muslims. Uh, so I was and especially like recently in France, the hijab questions flared up again, and this is how I heard about the conference on Facebook. You know, like suggestion I was like probably watching a video about it. Um, so yeah, first of all, I wanted to thank you because like growing up, I had a lot of female Muslim friends that uh, growing up like were torn probably by the same question that you've been through like between like their personal happiness and their personal happiness was like that relationship with their parents think like they, they don't speak English so they probably won't haven't heard about you but I think like yeah what you do uh, is surely helping a lot of people so thank you about that thank you um, there is like a, okay I, I won't 
I won't talk about like what I disagreed about, especially about like that syncretism, but like Abrahamic religion and stuff like this, because I can believe it myself. Mm -hmm. I will like just keep to my question uh, about like the hijab. Again, like in France, for the last 30 years, it has been like a, a huge topic flaring up like again and again, literally every like few years. Uh, there are like some rules, so especially the, the, the question, like it wasn't during your presentation, but later on when you spoke about like when society should intervene. It's like, I think the debate we are having, like, like maybe, so we, we, are, we had like in Lebanon, we are having in France, and I think we don't have it like yet in the United States because the Muslim community is not like as big proportionally to uh, like European countries. Uh, I don't wish it to happen here because it creates a lot of uh, unrest. Um, and like, yeah, the question about the hijab, so you have like some limits now. So it's like for, because like it's still like a free country because uh, like quite libertarian, but it's still like forbidden in schools and from public servants. Mm -hmm. And the question that was raised up recently was like Muslim parents going into school, accompanying uh, children was like outside of school activities but like still was like classrooms and wearing the hijab and so it sparked from like a, a, a principal asking a, a mother to take up their veil and it's raised the question again and the question is okay so obviously there is some contradictions even though there are like Muslim women that say like they do it fairly they do it either as a cultural like marker or like to fight against maybe uh, West, sexualized Western countries that are not used to. Uh, they do it like freely, but the idea, as you well explained, and we all understood, I think, is like there is, it's like a symbol of oppression of like woman that is like part of Islam, being like progressive or not. And so how in uh, Western countries that want to preserve uh, people's rights and people's freedom of religion, can we also uh, uh, fight, like, no, I don't like the way of fight, the, the word of fighting, uh, but like we can also uh, not promote uh, this and like not fight Islam, but the ID vehicle like about women, mm -hmm. and so where the marker should be, and also not to not doing it in a way that it will uh, in a conflictual way with our like Muslim compatriots because. It, I think I think it will like create the contrary effect, and this is what you were saying in France, as you said, with like second and third generation immigrants, they fe they feel like hostility maybe, mm -hmm. and so as a reaction, they will like go back into a more fundamentalist like way of thinking and like habits. So what would be as you you have like probably more experience by your background and the work you have done, like a good way to speak with uh, Muslim communities and non-Muslim communities about this to try to push uh, Muslims to a more liberal uh, way of thinking, mm -hmm. and especially toward women, and how uh, non-Muslim like uh, society uh, would be like what would be the best behavior to uh, to to fight to again yeah, yeah. I'm sorry about the uh, word, but like, yeah. I would use it like to, to to fight this idea and to like in, in a peaceful way and a way that would be like efficient. Right, okay. So, I mean, I'll, I'll let you guys, there was a lot there, but you don't want to Okay, well, yeah. I'll just, I'll do it. And we're running out of time, probably, so we will try and keep it concise. And are you also in line? That's really short. Okay, <laughs> all right. Um, well, I mean, that was a, I feel like there were a lot of questions there, but but generally speaking, I, I will say that our, our ex-Muslim North America's um, approach to this has been that you have to start opening up the avenues for dissent within the Muslim communities um, because there are people who agree, who want to fight, who are future you know, activists who don't feel as if they can stand up in that community. So that's why we build these alternative support networks for, for, for people from that background to know other people like them to find support and be able to stand up. And then we often find that a lot of those people end up becoming activists themselves and both of you were community members first, you know, just in part of the ex-Muslim communities, and then now you're, you're activists um, on your own behalf, and you're standing up and you're speaking, and you're, um, you know, uh, so that there are secondary effects to creating that social space, 
for dissent in general. As far as what we should be doing in communities, I, I, I disagree a lot with the, with the French model because I am a civil libertarian. I know that doesn't make me popular with, any, with, with anyone really. But um, I do think that um, it, there is too much of a risk when you ban symbols of, of, of religion. And maybe the way that they're doing it where they're very uniform about it uh, is not so harmful, but at the same time, it does limit a very religious women from taking certain positions and taking certain jobs. Um, when I think about Muslim women who are already oppressed, I don't want to. I don't want them to also not have um, the opportunity to work somewhere and potentially get enough income to be able to move themselves out of that situation if they so chose. Um, so I, I think the way we think about combating the hijab and we think what we're actually tackling is Islam because it's such a symbolic. It has such symbolic value. We're looking at these covered women, and to them, to, to us, they symbolize everything Islam is. But that's actually not true, and we have to remember that. That it's just that the hijab is a symptom of the belief, right? So what we have to tackle is the belief itself. And when we tackle hijabis, especially you know, hijabi women, and it's, it's so, it breaks my heart to hear about hijabi women being attacked um, you know, for, for any reason or being harassed, because again, there are visible they're visible Muslims in a way that almost nobody else is. So they are the targets, but they're also so, victims in so many, so many ways. Um, so it, you know, my feeling would be, uh, I think, just not to go on too long about it, but I remember there was a Burkini, you remember uh, that, that Burkini whole, ban. Burkini yeah. ban, a thing that came up. There was a village in France uh, that was coastal, and there were they had beaches, and there were a lot of Muslim women there who would go in wearing something called a Burkini, which was essentially a very loose. Uh, garment that was that was totally covered, um, like a wetsuit almost, um, and they 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 tried to ban it in their in their mm-hmm. locale, um, and they did they did right, but there was there was problems. <laughs> uh, but you know when I was looking at that and I was thinking about how I should feel, um, one it just felt to me that it was a very it was theater, you know it was we don't like Islam we don't like extremism we don't want these values so we're gonna ban this. But it, it doesn't take away the belief, right? People still, people will just, you know, be angry with you because you didn't let them practice the way that they wanted to practice. When it comes to forced women, if they're actually truly forced to wear it, if they're not allowed to go to the beach now, that's just one freedom that they once had that they no longer have. Because what is the family going to say? If you can't go out in fully covered, you can't go out to the beach, period. That's what they're going to say. So we have to think about when we're when we're thinking about how to how to handle Islam, we think too much about tackling just its visible manifestations of the belief. What we have to think about is what the belief actually is, and how can we dismantle that 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 faith, or have just provoke a little bit of doubt, just enough doubt that Muslims will be more tolerant. I'll add something very small, and also like what we uh, like keep on forgetting is that. If we continue to limit where these Muslim uh, hijabi women uh, go, then they won't be exposed to other people. They won't be exposed to other ideas. Uh, they won't be able to be. They won't be challenged for it. Let's say they did choose to wear this. They're not oppressed. They want to wear it because this is their choice and this is what they believe in. Then they won't be challenged by other people because they won't be going to work in public spaces or go to school or any of that. And it's. It's heartbreaking. When, when I heard about the, we're going to ban it in schools, like, okay, so now Hijabi girls can't go to school? So, I mean, it was school. They because, to, yeah. It was about teachers. Yeah, I know, but teachers still, like yeah. I, mm. Positions of authority and public But service. the thing is, like, those, those yeah. people it's also get us, those people also get challenged, either by people that they see every day, other workers that they live with. I mean, it's the more multi, like, more uh, variety there is in a society, it's less likely that the, this person is going to be fundamental. At least in my case, when I went to school, um, I, mean, I lived in Saudi Arabia, and it's a very like small, like people, it's, it's extremely segregated, not just genders. Uh, you know, the minorities don't, don't mix with each other. You know, people that are of different colors don't mix with each other. People of, that are tribal don't mix with people that are not tribal. But then you go to a school, you go to like a university, for example, and I, for me, I, I studied in the West, but I met people that I would have never met had I stayed in Saudi Arabia in my small circle of people. And it's, it's a whole different issue when you're like, oh yeah, well, I, I've always thought this about people from this region, but that's not true about them. And you become more tolerant towards that, uh, which just like, um, like Sarah, I'm against banning of any kind of symbols like that because then you're just giving it, first of all, you're giving it more value, and then you're, you're stopping people from 
that want to go and, and, and you know and um, you know contribute in their life from being exposed to other ideas. Um, agree with the discomfort on bands. But to your specific questions about how can this sort of fight can be yeah. fought quietly and sort of without the ban. Without the ban. So without the ban is fine. Yeah. But a revolution of ideas, and again, I'm not talking of the ban, I'm talking of everything else. You, you mentioned something, how can it be done peacefully? I don't think. Peacefully, but like uh, without antagonizing like, so, strongly. Because like, if you antagonize. We're saying the Quran is BS. We're antagonizing the entire Muslim population. A revolution of idea will never happen quietly, in comfort, keeping people in their comfort zones. Exactly. So right. it's going to happen messily right. Right. with a lot of anger. And, and that's a good thing. Unfortunately, that's a, that's that a, is. That's, that's, that's how you yeah. provoke change. Yeah, right. We have to push people outside of their, their comfort zone. So a polite revolution has never and will never happen. That being said, I, again, don't agree with the ban either. Yeah. But in terms of a war of idea, it's going to be messy. Yeah. It's not going to be done in a way that's pleasant for the people whose ideas we're challenging. OK, one more. One more question we have? And then it's a short one. Very short. Um, <laughs> thank you for coming. I recognize your extreme courage. Um, I think what you're doing is these kinds of open discussions are the stitches that help humanity and um, bring it forward. Um, something that a lot of religious communities have is a lot of communities which require a leap of faith have is um, like a, a weekly ethics discussion where they, they talk about good and bad. And they also have constant uh, community support. And I think that's something which those who are not in a leap of faith community, I think, greatly lack. There's there's not a lot of uh, this. Uh, I think this is what's needed. But are there other groups or organizations besides your own that you think do a good job of promoting um, humanist values on a constant and also cor cultural level? Yeah, I I, I think that that's an that's an interesting question, and that's a broad one. I mean, I'm sure you're familiar with some, the, the humanist groups in general who, who try to, to bridge that gap. There are humanist groups in almost every locale that try to meet regularly and also do meet regularly. There are some kinds of humanist institutions that try to mimic the church structure kind of directly, well, in the sense that they'll meet every Sunday and they'll, they'll have a place for families to come together, and the idea there is to give you a community as well. Um, and I think, you know, I don't know if we, we, what we haven't done is replaced church in the lives of people, in the social lives of people. And although we, we, we are good riddance to the ideologies uh, and all the social restrictions and all the human rights uh, problems, the community aspect of, of church is a good thing. And it's something that we are all missing and it makes us all lonelier and you know it, it isolated uh, less likely to feel as if we're one nation and we're one you know community and to have empathy for each other so we need to find ways to 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 bridge that gap I I don't know if 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 that's happened as well as it probably should but there are a lot of humanist groups atheist groups um, who try to do the same thing there's a model in Houston Oasis, Houston, Houston Oasis mm -hmm. where they meet every every Sunday they have like it's like a three hour thing, they have a lecture. Like they have a community um, hour, they have a community uh, hour, they somebody's eat together. Out. There's music. Yeah, there's music. They, they, they try to do that and I think they do a really great job. They're they're a really great group. Um, so that Houston Oasis model, I think that's it's spreading a little bit. There's another yes. chapter somewhere there's, else. There's one in South Houston. In Houston and South Houston. And uh, one in Kansas? Yeah, I think it might be Kansas City. So I don't um, I'm not sure, but there there's another one as well. So that's a good model to follow so, as well. But why don't you start one? <laughs> Can I say something? And my, my answer is completely different from Sarah's because I absolutely despise the church model and the whole community idea of like people coming together that have this one thing in common because each and every person in that group is different. Well, I am much more. Yeah, say I know, but, but but the thing is, I know, but this is a more of a is it's a more of a. Um, a support community that then it, then it is let's get that's together and talk about that's yeah right. that's yeah so right. that I'm okay I'm a, I, I like it's just that I don't like the idea of like congregating every one day and sitting together and talking about this it's, to me it's just too structured and too religious like and it and it causes me a lot of anxiety I'm more about like you're an individual you have interests go out and do your interests and um, if you want to spend time with these people go ahead and spend time with them 
but not because you have this one thing in common. I mean, it's great that I, I mean, I joined, just like I said, Explosive Economic Maker is essentially just that. But it's also, a, a, it's like a lot of the people that join, for, this is the first other ex-Muslim that they talk to. There are so many people when I did, um, when I was volunteering to do the screenings uh, for, for XMNA, there are so many people that I spoke to that were like, this is the first time I ever talk about this. I have never spoken to this with anyone, and you're the first ex-Muslim that I talked to. And it's, uh, so for, for me, that's a little different than uh, let's get together and have a, like an ethics moment. I mean, it's something that if you're interested in it, go ahead and do it. If you're not interested, you know, it's okay, you don't have to do it. I would be probably between both of them in that, like, I, I like that, I think, you know, we have to recognize that community is what probably what keeps people, a lot of people in religion when they don't necessarily believe anymore. Um, so community is important. I understand your point. So you don't want an echo chamber. So a community based on one thing. So we relate to each other because of our leaving Islam and often because of consequences. Um, that were brought to us because of that choice. So we need support and we don't necessarily relate that easily. The, the point and the hope is that one day we won't need this, that humans can relate to each other not based on the one thing that they have in, on, in common, but on the fact that we have humanity in common, no matter what else we have in common or not. So, I mean, I, I, I like that sort of model of community, but the hope would be that one day you meet other humans and you, you meet on Sundays to talk about anything, not about any specific one, one thing that is what you have in common, right? Just based on our humanity and desire to live together harmoniously and, and happily and have a you know, functioning civil society, so. Okay, I think we're, I think we're done. Yeah, well thank you. Thank you.